Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, librarian and archivist at the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is February 18th, 2022, and I'm very happy and really honored to be here um, with Vivian Vasquez Irizari, an educator, community activist, a facilitator, uh, the director and producer um, of Decade of Fire, a really excellent documentary about um, uh, the history of the Bronx that everyone should check out if they haven't, um, and been involved in various organizations throughout the years, 52 People for Change, National Congress for Puerto Rican Rights, um, and, and various other things that, that she'll get into in a little bit. Um, so Vivian, we always start these oral histories by asking people to say a little bit about their family's history and background and how they ended up in the Bronx. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you for having me. Um, my name is Vivian Vasquez Irizari. Vasquez is my father's name. Irizari is my married name. Um, I am a lifelong resident of the Bronx. I was born and raised in the old Lincoln Hospital. Okay, sure. um, my uh, parents came here at different times. They met here in the Bronx. My mother came in 1951. Um, yeah with her father first my grandfather came in about 1947 from san dulce puerto rico so let me sure. just go back a little bit um my grand my maternal grandmother is originally from corozal puerto rico and her dad owned a farm ran a farm in corozal um the the farm was uh held by the garcias and um, legend has it that my great-grandfather um, lost the farm because he promised it to one of his, um, what they call compadres, sure. when he died. So um, upon my grandfather's sudden death, his compadre knocked on my great-grandmother's door and said, now the land is mine. Mm -hmm and uh, they virtually left my grand my great grandmother homeless or you know the other legend is that my great grandfather lost the land um, in a gambling game okay, yeah. um, so we don't know but they uh, you know uh, based on what I understand had a lot of land and they lost it and so my grandfather sent his children into San Dulce to work in the hotels in San Juan. So sure. most of my um, my grandmother and her siblings worked as porters and maids in the luxurious hotels in San Juan. Sure. Um, and so it, my she met my grandfather there um, in San Juan working. And my grandfather is from um, Toa Alta or um, also from Corozal. They met there, they worked in San Dulce for several years married in San Juan um, and then my grandfather came here yeah. um, to work in a kitchen actually on a 167th Street oh. and then he worked in one of the hotels in Manhattan um, that was back in like the late 40s um, my understanding is that uh, his weekly salary was from seven to ten dollars a week okay. here um, working as a cook um, my grandfather would always uh, talk to us, and he, one of the things he always said to us was, Capiche? You capiche? And it was always because he said, that's the first you know, le word I learned in, in uh, English when he came to New York. Yeah. Um, eventually, he sent for my grandmother, um, and um, uh, my mother and her two brothers, and so they ended up on Hewitt Place sure. um, off of Westchester Avenue in the early 50s um, and um, my mother went to Grace Dodge High School okay sure and you know studied uh, at that time nursing um, wanted to become a nurse never ended up being a nurse but that's what she she took up and um, shorthand secretarial studies okay, yeah, so yeah. I remember as a child my mother was just you know her writing was really beautiful she learned beautiful penmanship and learned how to shorthand um, yeah. Right, at, at that time, that's what women, you know, learned to do sure, in sure. school. Um, and so, yeah, so my, so my grandparents rented an apartment in a building that uh, was like an enclave for 
artists. There were many artists that lived in that lived in the building. All kinds of artists, musicians, visual artists, um, graphic artists. Um, you know, people who were working um, at night. Yeah. Um, and what I recall my mother talking about was that when they moved into the apartment, the apartment was furnished with this beautiful furniture. I remember it as a child, the furniture, the china, the dining room table, the sofa was just so elegant. Yeah. Um, eventually, the artists kind of slowly moved out. Um, but uh, my grandparents lived in that apartment until about 1974. Oh, okay, wow, um, yeah. Um, my father came to the United States like at around 1954, 1955. Sure. Um, and eventually, he came because his older brother uh, came first, actually, oh, okay. and uh, rented a room in that apartment. So going back to that apartment, it was one of those what they call the train apartments where you had a long hallway and then sure. rooms. I think my grand in that apartment must have had like six bedrooms. Wow. In addition to my grandparents' uh, um, bedroom, and um, so my uncle, uh, what, who they called Tio Moncho, was, served in the U.S. military, and he ended up in New York, ended up in the Bronx, was a boarder in that apartment, and then eventually brought my dad sure. um, over. My dad worked in New Jersey, uh, but you know, I suppose. Um, you know, uh, I don't know, attraction, right? My mother was a young woman, uh, the child of the head of the household in that apartment, yeah. and my father was a boarder, and next thing you know, we had a wedding. Um, and then next thing you know, my older brother was born. Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So um, by the time I guess I was born, my dad worked in a, a furniture um, store. In, on Westchester and Prospect Avenue. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. sure, sure. Mm -hmm. um, and and what was your mom uh, doing before you were born, or what, was she taking care of um, uh, her, her children already at that yeah, point? Yeah, yeah, before, well, I'm one of five, so I'm, and I'm the third, so okay. my mother was a housewife. Sure. She actually, um, you know, what was interesting was, her story is that she was very frustrated in school um, and then felt like she wasn't going anywhere with that so she quit and yeah. so she left school before she graduated yeah um, high school she left Dodge before she graduated and um, then became a, a homemaker wow yeah mm -hmm. yeah you know a story that Elva told me about Dodge which is on her oral history um, she went there and in her senior year when she was looking for jobs and she, she went the secretarial path um, you know the the counselor told her straight up like you're probably gonna have a very hard time finding a job because you're Puerto Rican mm -hmm. and the only way that she found a job was because Evelina um, was working for uh, the union at the time and so she got a job through the union mm -hmm. but I'm sure that that was the same kind of case with many, many people, um, you know, attending Dodge at the time. You know, what's the point of attending if no one's going to hire you at the end? Of, at the end of it. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. My mother didn't have. I don't think she had a good time at Dodge. I mean, she has referenced um, racist comments being made to her. Yeah. Um, you know, as a child. Now, just to make a point about my mother as well my mother came when she came to the Bronx uh, when she was 10 but by the time she was about 15 she had to return to Puerto Rico because of uh, asthma oh, she okay. uh, got asthma uh, and uh, and then returned after like a year and a half or two years sure so she spent a couple of years back in Puerto Rico and then came back here I see. Um, so yeah, so that was that must have been interesting for her to return to Puerto Rico and then come back. Yeah. And then yeah. I think that's when she went to Dodge, and then you know just it didn't work out for her at Dodge. Yeah. But um, yeah, so uh, my parents moved um, as a they got married and then moved into 990 Leggett Avenue, okay. 
which is right on the corner of Leggett and Fox Street. Sure. In the South Bronx. Sure. Mm -hmm. and, th and that's the apartment that you grew up in? I, we grew up in that apartment until I was about seven or eight years okay. old. And sure. then we made the big leap of moving to the next building. <laughs> 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 right next to it, so we moved to 986 Leggett. Okay, okay. And so, uh, and the, and that's the building that I grew up in sure. you know, after my seven, you know, for most of my life. Do you have many um, memories still of the first building you lived in on Leggett? Oh, yeah, I do. Yeah. I have a lot of memories. What, what was there. that building like? Um, the lobby was big. I mean, one of the things that, you know, I, I often talk about um, was that. In Leggett, we had neighbors who were Cubans, we had neighbors who were Irish, sure. we had neighbors who were African American, we had neighbors who were who were Jewish, sure. and um, you know we had very close relationships with people in the building. So I remember as a child, you know, going into people's apartments, yeah. you know, go, going in um, barefooted, and you know, sitting there and like eating. Someone would always serve me like a rice soup or, you know, um, uh, you know, for Puerto Ricans, it was a salchicha. Sure, they, they would sure, serve sure. me Vienna sausages yeah. with crackers. Like yeah. that was the thing. Um, my mother uh, had a very close relationship to Ray Waldman, who was uh, a Jewish woman from Jewish descent. And um, her husband was a Holocaust survivor. And wow. so we would, as a little girl, I remember going up to the apartment, we would go there all the time because Ray was, um, for the most part, our babysitter. Whenever yeah. my mother had to go out and, you know, um, run errands, we would go up to Ray and her husband was very quiet and non-talkative, but we would see the marks on his arm. Wow. Um, and they also had a son named Melvin, Melvin Wallman. And we were pretty close to them. Um, eventually, her, her husband passed away. We remained very close to Ray until um, I think it was the 70s, the early 70s, that Ray moved out to the Burke houses, the Burke Avenue houses, okay, which was sure. a new development at the time. But even when she moved out, we would go up, uh, take the number two train to yeah. Burke Avenue and visit her in her new luxurious apartment. <laughs> um, you know, Ray was a very special lady. She, um, besides taking good care of us, she taught us how to play all kinds of card games. Wow. And, you know, she always had a cigarette in her mouth. And, <laughs> you know, um, but she constantly cooked for us. And she was just this really wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, um, and, uh, yeah, yeah. So we, you know, that's my memory of 990. Like, even when... We moved to 986. We still went to Ray's house, and we still depended on Ray, and Ray depended on us. You know, we did favors for Ray, and her son was um, a role model. Or you know, we looked up to him because he was several years. I think that when I was a little girl, probably like four or five, six, he was a teenager. Yeah. And so it was the first time we um, we heard the hermit hermits. You know, he okay. would play the Beatles for us. He would play the Hermit Hermits for us in his really cool record player in his room. And um, the Rolling Stones. Wow, um, yeah, You yeah. know, so he was our introduction to rock and roll. And, you know, like Melvin was just so cool. Um, um, so, you know, and then we had neighbors who moved to Florida. You know, I just remember uh, maybe one or two or three families eventually moved out of that building. Sure. In 990, um, uh, the president of the Dirty Dozens gang uh, was the super okay, okay, sure, of sure, that sure. building. Um, and so um, my parents actually developed a very uh, positive relationship with the super, with sure. Louis was his name. Um, and, uh, you know, even though he was the gang leader, I mean, it didn't matter. He did his job. He cleaned the buildings, and yeah. and you know, um, it was like a functional relationship. Sure. So, um, you know, I the other memory that I have of 990 was when um, one of our neighbors, and she was a, a older lady from Irish descent, she passed away, and um, uh, the police had to break her door down 
in order to find, you know, because people were complaining of a distinct smell. Sure. And um, I'll never forget, like, I'll, it's the first, my only time that I've smelled yeah. um, death that way, you know, the, yeah. a body decomposing. Um, I can still remember the Oof. smell. But it was a big thing, you know, because people um, hadn't realized that she was, you know, dead. But I remember, I, and I still have that, wow. that memory. Yeah. 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 So you mentioned the, the Dirty Dozens. Did you have much, um, uh, many run-ins kind of with the Dirty Dozens outside of the super? Um, were, were they kind of present on your block? Or? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they were very present on them. I mean, he, uh, Louis, um, grew and raised his family there. Sure, sure. And uh, all the families and friends, they were part of the block. Yeah. Um, so they were, they were, around constantly um one of the things that i talk about in my film um was that um, my mother sold avon sure and she sold avon to uh, louis wife myrna and all the other girlfriends of the um the gang and what i remember was well to go back um so my mother would sell would give the book and then um, they would order, right? My mother would place the order and then she'd uh, pack up all the items, put them in bags. And then it was the job of my sister and I to deliver the bags <laughs> throughout the neighborhood um, and collect the money. Sure, collect sure. Collect the, you know, the money of uh, whatever they purchased. And so what we noticed was that uh, the girlfriends always ordered a lot, you know. Um, so, you know, you had the normal customers like $10, $9, yeah. whatever. And then the girlfriends would order things like for $40. Which, so we always thought these women were rich, you know, yeah. these young girls were rich. Oh, yeah. this mascara and all the, you know, these like cosmetics. Um, and so, um, yeah, and so, um, you know, day-to-day -day relationships, uh, yeah. doing favors, borrowing sugar, Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, all kinds of things. Uh, the, 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 especially the women, um, but the guys in the, in, the, in the gang, they remember my mother because she was very friendly, yeah. very talkative, you know, never positioned herself as being afraid of the gang. Sure. She was just very outright. Um, whenever she had a complaint, uh, you know, I even often remember her kind of like scolding even louis yeah, the yeah. guys you know like oh my god that that pipe was in the wrong place take that <laughs> pipe out of there because you know it was sort of like sticking out um and you know they okay carmen yes carmen you know um uh i think they saw they respected her um sure. uh myrna also had you know a mother they had mothers too so yeah. um um uh, my mother sold Avon to some of the mothers as well. It was it was just you know a really nice relationship. We Absolutely. knew that they got in trouble. Sure. We knew that there were things that they were doing, but that didn't seem to be um, what got in the way of kind of like the day to day relationships. Yeah. Although you know you always had in the back of your mind, not just because of the gang there, but because of the context there that it was hard to always trust. Sure. But nevertheless, I mean, I think that. What helped, I think what helped the relationship building in my family was that my mother came when she was 10. So she yeah. wasn't um, a stranger to street life or she wasn't a sure. stranger and she spoke English very well so she could connect with the young people, um, you know, much better than some of the other families who came in after. Yeah, um, um, yeah I mean, when, uh, when Louis got shot for the first time, mm -hmm. It was my dad who took him to the hospital, wow. you know, who, who saw that. And he didn't see the incident, but he saw Louis lying on the floor. He took my dad to the hospital. Um, he took Louis to the hospital. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, and then there were the Savage Skulls that were around, too. They Absolutely. were like the friendly um, um, gang and, uh, and the Young Skulls. And I remember sure. one day, um, it was a summer day. I was about 10 years old, nine or 10 years old. We were playing out um, by the fire hydrant. We were getting wet um, and um, I got attacked by a dog. Mm -hmm. And it was the head of the young skulls who picked me up and brought me home. Yeah. You know, and he was a very um, well-known character. His name was Hippie. 
and sure. you know people loved hippie and they feared him at the same time but yeah. here's hippie he takes me he picks me up in his arms and he carries me all the way to the second floor to my mom um um and he you know he stayed there until he saw that i was okay with my fa family and you know it was just a funny scene because all the kids followed us into <laughs> my my mother's apartment into our apartment and she kept trying to bring my pants down and and I kept pulling them up because I didn't want Hippie to see my butt, you know, it was, I was so embarrassed. Um, and he wasn't embarrassed, of yeah, course, he was sure. just worried about me. Sure. But, um, you know, those were the kinds of relationships we had. Yeah. Um, very close, yeah, I mean, yeah. it's a very close-knit community, yeah. I mean, and that's something that comes out again and again in various neighborhoods throughout. Um, the South Bronx at that period is just, you know, how close knit the community was. Yeah, um, yeah. The guys from the the gang also would um, host games for the little kids on on the block. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and you know, it's interesting reading newspaper articles about the gangs at the time because you know, to a T, they're always trying to highlight whatever bad the gangs might or might not be doing, and they'll sometimes quote gang members are saying, you know, well, you know, yeah, sometimes we do, we do bad, but what we really are about is like caring for the community. And, you know, of course the newspaper articles always call that into doubt, but mm -hmm. you can't, you can't call into doubt people's experience. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you, you want to talk about, um, 987 some and you, 986, 986, 986. Okay. Yeah. 986 mm -hmm. some, mm -hmm. some, because you already mentioned kind of when, when you were injured, the, influx of kids from the neighborhood who, who came into your mom's, uh, you know, came in uh, to your apartment. But you, you were talking before we started about um, kind of how your apartment was this hub mm -hmm. of, uh, mm -hmm. of, for children in, on your block. Yeah. Um, so um, my mother was somewhat active in school. In our, our elementary school was just a block away and our intermediate school was about two blocks away sure two to three blocks away and my mother was somewhat in um active in in ps62 she would um make the costumes for the school plays okay. wow. um, my mother console she's a seamstress so um so we made you know we made a lot of friends in school we made a lot of friends in um around the neighborhood and one of the things that that um i think stood out for us in in my father's eyes because my father wasn't always um he was kind of like more uh, my father had a more strict values um and attitudes and practices um that my mother would allow all the kids to come to the house you know so we had kids come over at any time you know i just remember my friends when they were little when we were little they'd come and they like open the refrigerator and you know my father wouldn't like that and you know my mother was like no no it doesn't matter you know um we had neighbors downstairs who had kids i mean i think that you can imagine a building with like families of kids all over Absolutely. and um s somehow our our apartment became the hangout you know and then eventually my brother um and his friends formed a band um, much like the Ghetto Brothers, sure. um, they formed a band. They were really into rock and roll, and uh, and Santana. Yeah, um, yeah. And uh, they played, and um, they would, little by little, you know, they uh, uh, bought instruments sure. and would rehearse in my brother's room um, almost every day after school. Um, and uh, uh, when my father wasn't home, um, and and it would be timed just so um they would rehearse in the living room okay. and, and my mother would allow it i mean yeah. you know the amps and the guitars wow. and the drum sets were in the living room and you know my friends would come over and and we would just the guys would blast music and you know sometimes i'd be in my room like frustrated or sometimes i'd watch them perform um you know or uh we also um uh we didn't start, but we were part of this like um, neighborhood softball league, which was uh, okay. truly amazing. Sure. Um, and it started with some of the guys from United Bronx Parents, okay, yeah. right? And some of the guys from the gangs. You know, it was just this um, 
uh, uh, complex collaboration of blocks, Prospect, um, Leggett Avenue, Beck Street, Avenue St. John, Longwood. Sure. And people, uh, it started, I think, with the guys, and they began to develop these teams. And then next thing you know, we had a league, yeah. and uh, there was a schedule, and wow. there was, and you know, most of us worked at United Bronx Parents. Sure. And um, so for our summer youth employment, our first paycheck for um, from summer youth was used to go to Southern Boulevard and purchase... Uh, our uniforms so oh, we would all uh, get uh, you know every block had their colors and their shorts and yeah. we all kind of like organized our uniforms and sneakers and socks and we would um, then there was a schedule a, a team schedule and I have to tell you this was all developed by the young people yeah. right yeah. Um, and uh, and then we had we played you know we played all summer all spring all summer all fall and we also developed new friendships sure. as a result of this league. And, and, you know, the girls were always in my house and the guys were in my house. And that was as we, you know, were growing into middle school towards high school. Um, again, my mother allowed us to, like, put the furniture back and we would practice dancing the hustle for <laughs> hours and hours and then play softball, <laughs> play softball and then practice wow. the hustle, you know. And then in between, I would try to... Um, recruit my friends to listen to Freddie Mercury because that was my thing. Sure, sure, sure. Um, but, wow. you know, um, and so there were people in my building that were a part of that. There were people out in the next building, next block, and then, you know, next thing you know, um, there were, folk, you know, friends from all over coming to my house and wow. just being a part of whatever. Um, and I, I don't want to say whatever, but I felt like what my mother did was to provide us with a safe space, sure. you know, outside of United Bronx Parents, which we can talk about later. But yeah. that was a place where it could have sort of once it was time to leave UBP, you know, we kind of went into my apartment and you know, wow. continued just, you know, what teenagers do, yeah. gossip and talk and, you know, talk about boys and, and things like that. Um, but we had, you know, we had some pretty interesting characters in my building. And one thing I want to say about 986 as well, um, which is why I think that um, my building did not burn, you know, um, was that our landlord um, took care of our building. Sure. Um, he was also a Holocaust survivor. Sure. And um, we regularly saw him. Yeah. Um, and I think he played both role as landlord and superintendent. Wow. His name was Gene. I don't remember his last name, but you know he was well respected yeah. um, among the tenants. And and I think he owned this building next to us, nine eighty two. Um, and he was, um, you know, uh, committed to us and to the building wow. until he passed. Once he passed, then, you know, there were issues with what the, actually the tenants took over. Sure. We had my parents and the other tenants. Um, they had to buy a boiler and all of that. But, oh, wow. but before yeah. that, um, you know, our landlord was a decent guy. Wow. Um, and, um, you know, I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, because yeah. that's a relatively rare um, I, I, it is now, and I, it was it was then for sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, wow. Um, so j j just to hear a little bit more about the softball league, were there multiple fields or locations that you all played at, or just just one field? Yeah, there were a couple of fields. There weren't multiple. There was the main one. It started out, I think, with us at uh, PS sixty two. Sure, sure. And then fifty two. Okay. Yeah. And then we were able to use the field at IS eighty four, which was um, closer to um, like one fifty sixth Street in Westchester. Sure, sure. Um, uh, 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 on occasion, we were able to use that field, but those were the basic fields. I yeah. hit my first home run at IS84. Oh, I, right. I'll never forget that one. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, and and you said um, you were, you were obviously into Freddie Mercury, and your your brother was in a, a rock and roll band. You want to talk more about? Uh, kind of music in general around your house, around your neighborhood, what kinds of music that you were listening yeah. to, were there sh you know, live shows that you might have gone to or any anything along those lines? Yeah, I think that um, uh, when I was very young, 
um, a little girl, I actually thought I was Mexican okay. because my dad used to love to listen to the ranchero music, sure. the old Mexican music. And you know, um, at some point in our history, um, in the 40s and 50s, Mexican cinema was all the rage. Yeah. And so, you know, my parents would um, see uh, Cantinfla on sure. the TV, you know, and, and that was like really amazing. Um, and I, you know, I guess I didn't know the difference, right? We, I, we were just listening to music. Um, but then we had um, a lot. My mother loved doo Okay. And sure. so she would play doo um, kind of being raised in New York. And, yeah. And um, she'd play the Platters and um, all those different bands that I can't remember their names. I'm she sorry. Fawns. But she, yeah, yeah, yeah. All yeah. the kind of like. Uh, these vocal bands and she would have play with them on her eight track cassette okay. tape in the house um, and then you know I think that she um, she allowed us to listen to anything we wanted to listen to yeah. you know so we were introduced to all kinds of music and um, you know next thing you know we're listening to Blue Note and we're okay. listening to the stylistics. The stylistics was um, one of my favorite um, groups back then, you know, um, listening to James Brown. Okay, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You know, listening to uh, just all that. It, we heard it out in the street. We heard it on the radio. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, we loved it. Um, my brother started listening to rock and roll and... Um, you know, playing paddle ball one day with the, the, that's another thing that um, we did a lot was we played paddle ball. Sure. There were a lot of paddle ball tournaments in, yeah. in the South Bronx as well. Um, and while we were playing paddle ball, I, was, I listened to um, Bohemian Rhapsody for the first time. Wow. And I said, What is that? Yeah. Um, and uh, fell in love with Queen ever since. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we. We listened, then my sister, uh, my older sister, got into Barry White. Okay, she yeah. was a big Barry White fan, and I was a big Queen fan. And my brother was into the Rolling Stones, and my mother was still playing her doo-wop. And, you know, wow, yeah. my father was playing Jose Jose. And, um, you know, we all kind of listened to whatever we wanted to listen to. Yeah. Um, and kind of... Um, appreciated all the music that was around us sure sure and and you you already mentioned that you you would dance to hustle with your friends sometimes mm -hmm. as well so that's yeah. going on yeah as well um yeah. is that the only kind of dancing that you were doing at the time or yeah i mean at that time uh you know for family events we would kind of dance salsa but i wasn't sure. really into salsa back then um we we learned the hustle um, you know, and, and, you know, quite frankly, there are two kinds of hustle. There's a hustle in the way that the Puerto Ricans danced it, and there was a hustle in the way that the African Americans danced it. Sure, and we sure. could dance both of them. I was wow. able to, you know, um, we were able to get down to both kind of styles. And, and that was fun. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, we danced like that. And then it wasn't until I went back to Puerto Rico on vacation for like, um, what was I, 16, 15, that I then got into uh, salsa music. Sure, you know, sure. To but, you know, we, again, um, uh, the, uh, the, the environment, uh, despite all the burning yeah. <laughs> that was happening around us, yeah. we'd find the time to, you know, uh, and being a kind of like a Latino community, um, but not just Latino community, because I want to talk about collaborations, um, uh, there was always a dance. There yeah. was always a sweet 16. There was someone was his birthday. And, you know, there, I remember just being a part of so many different, um, you know, parties and celebrations yeah. um, as a teen um, where, you know, uh, there was preoccupation with getting the dresses made sure. and tailored and, you know, matching the right shoes with the guys. I mean, there was this, all this activity around, um, you know, building community yeah. with young people, um, which was, which was a lot of fun. And one of those things was the hustle. Now, my sister and I, um, you know, I would say 14, 15, 16, we weren't allowed to 
travel to Manhattan sure. to the different like Studio 54 and all those clubs, the yeah. limelight. We weren't allowed to go, but there were certainly enough of those activities in our neighborhood that kept us there, you know, and, yeah. and we, um, you know, we, a lot of church dances and things of that nature. Sure. You know, St. Athanasius, St. Margaret's, course, yeah. Episcopalian, um, St. Anselm's sure. would make themselves available so that we could, you know, we could dance. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. What, what about, were there community centers that you all went to either in your neighborhood or a little further away in yeah. the Bronx? Well, the main community center that uh, we were a part of was United Bronx Parents. Sure, sure, sure. So I remember when we were young, we would go to St. Mary's Park and, um, you know, uh, swim in sure. the swimming pool um, uh, at certain times of the year. But our, my, our main place was UBP. Um, UBP, uh, and, and for a little bit, St. Margaret's, but not so much. Yeah. Um, UBP was a place where my sister, my older sister, worked year round. Yeah. And um, I worked there as a summer youth employment. But even going before that, you know, uh, and, and I had not made this link until um, long afterwards, was that uh, UBP provided free lunch, free breakfast and lunch. Um, and so there were times during the summer where my mother would say okay go over there go to 1 p.s. 1 30 and get your lunch and your breakfast yeah. you know and, and bring take it so there were five of us so the yeah. five of us would go and um and get our our sandwiches and our lunch and you know it was sure. really great um and uh i you know at that time i don't think i knew where that was coming from yeah but then eventually uh you know as i um, worked for the summer youth employment program I think I worked for UBP summer maybe three years. Sure. And um, and you know we worked, we cleaned up the park, and we um, we went on trips. And it was the first time I think I went to Coney Island. And, okay. Yeah. You know, uh, we were exposed to different places throughout the city. Um, we had um, uh, what I'll call counseling sessions. At that time, they were called rap sessions. Oh, sure, sure, sure. For you know the older. Uh, employees at UBP the 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 counselors yeah. would sit us down and talk to us about what was going on in our lives and you know um, build relationships with us so that I guess we could feel safe I feel like that was important you know looking yeah. back going to a safe place every day in the summer um, you know making friends having fun being engaged in in fun activities um was was important yeah was absolutely. really important to to me absolutely mm -hmm. did you um did you uh really get to know evelina at all while you were at ubp or no. she was just kind of an omnipresent figure in she the was an omnipresent figure in the background yeah, um, yeah, yeah you know it was actually her her daughter lorraine was the more present of sure. of I remember Lorraine more. Of course, we remember Joey because he was our age. Yeah, you know, yeah, he yeah. would we would hang around with him and other young people. Um, what I remember about Evelina was that when we were on site um, in the building in one of the classrooms or walking, when she walked around us, we had we were straight arrows <laughs> that's what i remember like oh oh there she is there she is you know she had this presence about her we all knew she was the boss yeah we all knew she was nice but we all knew that she was fierce and so you know i i think i remember one time i um i walked past her i was running past her and my sister said stop stop running stop running there she is i'm like okay okay you know um but you know uh i don't remember um like we didn't have conversations sure. or anything now sure. there is one story that um i hope my sister doesn't mind I, i'll tell my sister uh after once she was in college she decided to get married to uh one of the boys in the neighborhood um henry and uh days before her scheduled date wedding date she still had not received her marriage certificate oh, and okay. so my sister called me and you know and she was worried and we were in the house and you know people were in panic mode 
And then eventually uh, my sister thought about calling Evelina. And next thing you know, the uh, story is that she called him Vadillo. And then in 24 hours, we got the, birth cert- the marriage certificate. <laughs> and so Evelina saved my sister's wedding. Wow. Um, you know, so she was that close to my sister in, in certain ways. Wow. Because um, my sister worked all year round, so she sure. would have had more contact with Evelina and the senior staff. Sure, sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Wow, yeah. I mean, it's amazing to, to hear stories about United Bronx parents because, you know, literally built from the ground up in, in, in 65, and there's nothing really like it. I mean, as far as all of the different things that it was yeah. doing. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the thing, again, that I speak to, and it's maybe because I um, worked in youth development, it was there where I met other young people, like my our our friendship group expanded yeah. right we got we just i got out of leggett avenue and fox street ubp and then out of there it was like these baseball leagues people were doing all kinds of things we met other teens um of course we met other boys um and then um we met older teens sure. who pro- who provided a role or you know they were role models for us they were they were showing us that hey, these teens are doing really positive work. Yeah. And some of these older teens were members of the gangs, sure. were not members of the gangs, were, um, were in college, were doing interesting things in high school, were artists, yeah. were doing political work, were doing social work. Um, you know, sort of people we knew, like, uh, you know, we knew, met someone who was a, a, a real, like, hustle dancer, was sure. champion hustle dancer. You know, so it kind of opened up possibilities by... Yeah. Just by the mere fact that uh, UBP was so open to bringing in so many different kinds of people, um, again, in a safe place. And I'll tell you, I never saw a fight, an argument, or it was just a real fun place to just be as a person, as a kid. Yeah. Um, that, was, that was pretty incredible. Absolutely. It was pretty incredible. Absolutely. Um, so one, one thing that... Um You've already mentioned in passing here and there, but uh, but I, but I think it'd, it'd be interesting to hear more about. Is you want to talk a little bit about um, the kinds of foods that you remember eating, either mm-hmm. in your house or you know, at UBP or around the neighborhood, things like that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I just want to say one more story about UBP, oh, and, sure, sure. and that is that um, uh, my boyfriend, who is now my husband, I've been with my husband for uh, quite some time now, but. When he came, first came to my neighborhood, because he's from Manhattan, when he first came, the first thing I did was I took him to UBP wow. so that he could meet <laughs> the counselors and so the counselors could approve. And I guess they approved, <laughs> they huh? Yeah. You know, I remember, and the counselor that was available at that time was Butch, who wow. unfortunately passed away, but, you know, I had him sit down and meet Butch. Wow. I mean, that speaks to how important it was in your life at yeah. the time. Yeah, yeah, I wanted him to meet Gus, I wanted him to meet Butch, I, you know, like, I wanted him to meet all these people wow. <laughs> so that they can approve. <laughs> and, and they can also show him that, you know, I was protected or, you know, yeah, yeah, they yeah. had my back. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, but that's important. That's yeah. how important UBP was, to me, you know, and, and the people in there. Absolutely. Um, so... Uh, you know, we basically uh, ate typical Puerto Rican food. Sure. Um, again, you know, I think that this theme is all around my mom. But my mom, she would make ham with pineapple. Sure. She would try pork chops with jelly. Like my mom had the Betty Crocker cookbook <laughs> and would try different recipes um, and so she, she kind of exposed us to mainstream culture um, in a way that I felt some of my friends had not been exposed, sure, you know, sure. um, even people in my building, you know, um, some people lived in like real traditional households. Yeah. Um, and my mom was pretty much like, oh, let's try that. Let's go, here. you know. Um, and um, so I remember we would eat different kinds of foods you know for the most part typically puerto rican food sure sure um but i also remember you know my mom used to like make donuts oh 
okay, you know, wow. like who made donuts? Nobody else made donuts. My mother <laughs> would fry donuts. Wow. And, you know, make pineapple upside down cake and make like ham made the gringo way, sure, yeah. you know, like, you know, my mother would have these um, epiphanies of doing things and, and um, my friends were like, your mother is doing, you know, people thought my mother was cool in that yeah. sense. But yeah, we ate, um, we ate a lot of uh, different foods, you know, uh, of course, we always had a Chinese restaurant in the neighborhood right sure. we had a chinese laundry in the neighborhood mr and mrs lee and then we had the a restaurant which was considered really fancy on uh southern boulevard between um uh, avenue st john and fox i think it was no okay. not fox but uh, yeah between fox and avenue st john there was yeah. a, f a fancy chinese restaurant um uh there was a cuban restaurant in the area um, we hardly ate there, but we would, you know, um, occasionally have takeout. Sure. Um, but, you know, um, I think that, and when it came to food, I think my mother struggled to make sure that we had food on the table yeah. um, on a regular basis. You know, like I remember one time we didn't have meat for quite a while. Sure. Um, you know, we didn't eat steak or anything like that. Um, lots of rice and beans. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And, um, you know, um, ponche, which is mm -hmm. malta mm -hmm. with an egg, sure, with a raw sure, egg. Sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, we would have that, you know, and a lot of mashed potatoes. Sure, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And with, oh, go ahead. Oh no, no, you go ahead. And I just wanted to to talk about uh, on the corner of 990 and Fox Street was a grocery store, mm -hmm. and at the time, um, uh, people could buy their food there I mean, we had a we had a supermarket sure. and we had a, a meat uh store uh, la caneseria it was sure. called la caneseria but we also had louis store on the corner and at louis store we could buy items um what's called fial mm. so you know louis had a book and so i could go in there and say oh my mother needs milk and this and this and that and sure. then i get it and louis would mark it on the book and then by the end of the week or two um, then my parents would pay him. So it was like food bought on credit. And Absolutely. he had this thick notebook and, you know, everybody could buy Absolutely. items on credit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No no interest, of course. It's, no. It's something that um, that I've heard uh, so many people talk about is, is that particular practice that, you know, whatever neighborhood they were they were in is, is, is you know, that going on, um, which is an incredible, yeah. incredible thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was never denied. Like if we ever needed anything, it was never denied. And, yeah. um, you know, Louis, the owner of the store just knew everybody in the neighborhood. Everybody knew him. Yeah. Um, which was, was, was really great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, 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 mm -hmm. that, that's something I was going to ask you about. Um, uh, actually it's the stores in the neighborhood. If, if you had close relationships with, um, some of the, the store owners or people mm -hmm. who worked there. Um, it sounds like you definitely did. Yeah, um, yeah, there was, you know, the tax guy. Um, I don't remember his name, but he was a Jewish guy. And, you know, people went there to do their taxes. Um, you know, again, the, the laundry mat, um, the supermarket. People, my parents, you know, knew the folks in the supermarket. And at that time, um, even if it was two bags, they always had young men carry the grocery bags yeah. <laughs> back to our apartment. So, you know. Um, and then my mother went to uh, the meat store and would get, um, you know, um, alcapurrias oh, and sure. relleno de papas. Sure. Every Saturday we would make that trip in the morning to get our share of those. And, and um, uh, the activity wasn't just to step into the store, purchase something and leave. Sure. The activity was you go into the store and then you have a 10 minute conversation. I remember this because as a child, I wasn't very patient about yeah, it, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. have a, a conversation. And then, you know, my mother would grab the bag and she's still talking. My father or my father would grab a bag and they're still talking to the owner or they're talking to the person here. And then, you know, there was always this social, um, you know, component to shopping, which Absolutely. as a kid would be like, I'd be like, oh, my God, let's just get out of here. Um, but that's the way it was. I just, and I remember one time we were on a store, we were in a store on, on Southern Boulevard that my father used to frequent all the time. And one time he called the guy 
um, I was very young, I was little, but I remember this. Um, it was an African-American man behind the counter sure. and my father walked in and he said, hey, my friend, how you doing? And then the guy said, yeah, my brother, how you doing? Yeah. And then, you know, my father bought whatever he bought and then uh, we walked out and I said, but he's not your brother? Like, why, are you, why is he saying that? And he goes, yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're like family. And yeah. I, you know, as a kid, I was trying to wrap my head around sure. what that meant sure. because I thought, oh, I, this is the first time I see that man. And, you know, um, and so, you know, that's the sense. I think that that was sort of the beginning of understanding that we're all in it together. Yeah. yeah. You know, that, that we're all kind of, um, that relationships are important. That it didn't matter if you were blood or not. That sure. but that you treated people with respect. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Was your was your father still working at the furniture store? Um, yeah. All this time. He actually worked in the furniture store until the seventy uh, seven blackout. Okay. Or I mean, I think the furniture store tried to remain in business um, for maybe a year after that or something, and then after that he lost his job. Sure, yeah, sure, sure. and then he started. What he started to do was like going out to collect bills from the store, okay, and then um, try to continue. My father, uh, he did two things for uh, the furniture store. Oh my god, what was the name of the furniture store? It was right next to the Paradise Theater. Mm. Um, they had the furniture store had a a. a carpet linoleum showroom in the back okay so my dad was the salesman for the carpet linoleum showroom sure. he took orders you know he convinced people to buy yeah and then on certain days of the week he would go and install oh, the carpet oh, so wow. my father wow. installed so carpet and and, um, and rugs yeah wow. um and uh um so he did that for a long time yeah mm-hmm yeah. Until the '77 blackout. Mm -hmm. Okay, I see. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing um, that I, I'm curious about on your block, when you were growing up, did you see much, um, much, like many people that you know were struggling with heroin or anything like that, or was that mm -hmm. just not present for you? It was present. Yeah. Um, uh, so we knew who the heroin addicts were. Sure. Um, you know, looking back, while I think to a certain, I mean, one thing that uh, I kind of want to clarify or, or just reflect on is that there were a lot of things that were taking, that were happening, that was happening, right, that were taking place in the South Bronx that sure. probably children shouldn't have seen or lived in right but yeah. for me it was normal like sure. it was it was what we the only thing we knew right sure. so it was our context of what it was so seeing a heroin addict um kind of like um i've never seen anybody shoot up if that's sure. what you know we, we've never seen i've seen people i think they would go to dens or whatever yeah, but yeah, what yeah. we would see is them uh being high on the street nodding and off. nodding off right so yeah. so the the nodding off was something that we saw and um, we just left people alone, sure, uh, sure. and they were, they were someone's daughter, son, or kid, or whatever. So they were, they were not considered dangerous. Sure, they sure. were not, you know, they were considered a little seedy, yeah. and um, we knew not to go near them, right? Yeah. But um, I, I don't know whether there was that sense that we were gonna like get robbed. Although when I was about fifteen. 16 I did get mugged by a person who was on drugs but anyway um for the most part growing up as a kid they were just a part of the fabric of the neighborhood sure. and um you know obviously they had problems or whatever but we we weren't um I wasn't uh we weren't like oh my god yeah that's terrible or you know um they they also um quite frankly didn't seem like they were always hungry or even homless sure and they might have been homeless but it 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 the um the severity didn't seem like what we see today know. you know um it, it, you know it, it was like oh yeah and, and they you know 
even when we went to Puerto Rico, there was like the the, the, the common drunk of the village. Sure. And he was someone's family member and people just left him alone. Yeah. It was that kind of, um, you know, uh, dynamic that took place. Sure, sure. Because yeah. you knew, even if you didn't know him directly, you at least knew who his family probably was or, right. or this or that, still that kind of very close-knit yeah. sense of community. There. Yeah, yeah. And now, but nevertheless, I mean, crime was in the back of our minds sure. all the time. Sure. It was one of those things that was always here. Yeah. Um, you know, my uncle was murdered um, mm. when I was a little girl. Um, uh, they say it was sort of, uh, you know, a mistaken identity. Mm. Somebody shot him thinking they were going to shoot someone else. And, um, and, you know, you always had that be careful going out and especially the older I got. Yeah the more destructive the South Bronx became. Um, yeah. It was very important not to walk certain streets, not to talk to certain people. Absolutely. Um, you know, but the, you know, and, and the fires also had a kind of like a, a shield or a kind of like a, a level of fear. Sure. And, and that fear was, well, it could be my building, it could be me next time. Watch out for the fire. You know, there was always that. Absolutely. It wasn't... I think for some people, may, but in my household, it wasn't like, oh my God, there's going to be a fire. Yeah. But be careful, watch out, keep your shoes here, do this, do that. Sure. Um, it was just a fact of life that we just needed to watch out for Absolutely. the fire. But, you know, I've often thought about how that affects people, you know, growing up yeah. in that situation um, versus someone who grows up in a different environment where they never have to worry if a fire is going to consume their household, or if yeah. they never have to worry about whether crime is going to, um, you know, consume their, their family. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and, and yeah, maybe at this point, if you want to, obviously for people listening and watching this, um, uh, if you haven't already, you should definitely watch Decade of Fire because um, there's just so much in that movie about this but if, if you want to um, you know talk more about your experience with the fires like maybe your block if you want to you know talk about were there fires on your block mm -hmm. or you know, what was what was the kind of first memory yeah. you had of the fires yeah. um, I was very young uh, yeah. I might have been maybe six or seven and I remember it was a very early morning and uh, we look out my mother's bed from my mother's bedroom window, which faced the front of the building, the block, and across the street, the laundry mat there was up in flames. Wow. And so I, I remember like the high flames, I remember the heat, um, and um, you know, kind of like the, I, I was kind of mesmerized by and thinking, oh my God, what is that? Um, and then uh, a couple of years later, several years later, actually, the two buildings on the corner of my block yeah. were set ablaze. Oh, okay. And, um, and then next thing you know, Fox Street was set ablaze. And then that here, you know, Fox Street on one side and then Fox Street on the other side was set ablaze. And, um, you know, um, uh, so always worried again about whether my building was going to burn or who was going to burn it or how, you know, um, that, that was, um, always front and center kind of. Sure. But, um, as I said before, I don't think we lived like in terror. We yeah. were just, you know, after a while it just became normal. You sure. know, I come home from school and there was a fire. I stopped looking at it. Yeah. You know, I just went home. Um, yeah. and, and I remember at, so at times, the um, the smell would bother me, sure. so I wanted I wanted to get home as soon as possible, so I didn't have to smell yeah. so much of the the burn. Um, yeah, uh, you know, if I if I may, I mean, I'm gonna speak for my sister. I think my sister remembers the fires a lot more. Um, you know, kind of like starkly. She's and she's a lot more like it's more visceral for her sure she's two years older and I think that she and some of these fires really um, scared her and we had fires in my building yeah but they were never really set um, by arsonists they were accidental fires sure sure we've sure. had you know a couple of accidental fires sure. and um, 
I remember in one in one occasion we had a fire it was late at night and our first floor neighbor burned something in her kitchen and uh, everybody had to evacuate the building and we evacuated the building and then next thing you know my mother says where's Edward and we're like Edward Edward's my younger brother yeah. he's the one he's the fourth comes after me and we're like oh my god what happened to Edward where's Edward come to find that we forgot him oh, and we left wow. him sleeping because it was late at night sure. and my mother just ran out and she forgot my brother <laughs> so for years my brother was like and you guys left me and the, you know and it was it wasn't a serious fire sure. you know, they, the fireman put out the fire in that apartment in that kitchen yeah um but uh, it scarred my brother for a very long time, probably till I, I don't know if we should, you know. For uh, sure. Yeah, but um, but it, you know, uh, there was always a fire, and the, I think that the um, the the memory of just all the abandoned buildings, of all the burnt out buildings, of yeah. all the rubble, of all the you know the yards, all the the aftermath of the fire sure. was what was uh, what kind of um, laid on a very depressing tone for the neighborhood. Yeah. So you know you have a fire, but then you rebuild. You yeah. know, yeah. You, if if you're lucky, right? No, nobody gets hurt, but you rebuild. Sure. But just the reminder of the the destruction the con you know everywhere you looked something was destroyed the neighborhood looked pretty devastated it looked ugly yeah. um you know it, it looked like there was you know no no chance of anything getting repaired the idea that something would be rebuilt i, I don't know was anybody going to rebuild it you know it was sure. just a, it was just a very sort of Depressing for me anyway, a depressing place to be. Yeah, um, yeah. Especially when during that time on Thursday nights at 7 or 8 p.m., we would watch the Brady Bunch. Oh, and okay, we then sure. compared, you know, we weren't um, intentionally doing that kind of analysis. Yeah, yeah. But in the back of our consciousness, we were. Of course. We were looking at, we were, you know, like, oh, wow, look at that. Look at how nice their house. Oh, you know, look yeah. at Donny Osmond and his family. Look yeah. at the Brady Bunch, you know. Look and the at, only thing they have to worry about is not getting a date or something like that, right, you know. Right, right. You know, yeah. having a nice place to live and, and having nice rooms and having a nice neighborhood. That, you know, kind of smacked us in the face all the time. Like, you know, I'm here sure. you are. And, um, you know, I think that that was, that was, uh, um, it kind of perpetuated ideas and thoughts like here we were, we were stuck or we have to get out, you know, yeah. I, and, and that's what I thought I have to get out of here. Sure. That's what you thought. Yeah. And, um, were you going to high school in the neighborhood or did you go to a high school outside of the neighborhood? Yeah. Um. I wanted so badly to get out of the neighborhood yeah. and the guidance counselors at IS 52 wanted me to get out of the neighborhood, wanted my sister to get out of the neighborhood because we were relatively um, high performing students sure. and we were, you know, we were pretty good and, you know, for some reason, you know, I know, I say for some reason, I know the reason, we weren't really involved in gang life, yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. Um, our, our, my father was very strict, Sure. so we had a curfew and, and all of that, so we, you know, and he monitored where we would go and all of that, so, um, so they, my sister uh, enrolled into uh, Music and Art High School, uh, okay, which okay. is now LaGuardia, sure. and um, I went to Murray Bertram High School, which is all the way down Police Plaza, okay, wow, in, in wow, yeah. Brooklyn Bridge, the last stop of the six train, Yeah. and um, for both my sister and I, I think it was eye-opening, because I was able to leave the neighborhood every day, sure. and at Bertram, Bertram was a relatively new high school. Um, at the time, and it also attracted kids from all over the city. Okay, so and I so see. it introduced me to that sort of cosmopolitan New York feel. Sure. Um, close to Chinatown, there were a lot of Asian kids. 
there were, you know, again, I met a lot of Jewish kids. There were a lot of Italian kids from yeah. Brooklyn, you know, and so I, I kind of began a friend group that was very diverse. Sure, sure, mm -hmm. sure. Mm -hmm. um, and, and do you want to talk more about your experience at that high school as far as, you know, the classes, the teachers, just, you know, being at this place so far from your neighborhood every, every day in and out? Mm -hmm. Um, I think that, uh, for one, because it had, it was a smaller high school, um, it, it had, right, these high expectations mm. of, of all its students. Sure. So it really didn't matter where I came from. Yeah. I had to perform just like every other kid, and, and every other kid had to perform just like me, or, you know, um, so we weren't... I don't believe that, you know, um, that could, that it might have happened in, in South Bronx schools like Monroe, which is where most of the sure, my friends sure. were zoned into. Yeah. Some could get into Morris, but yeah. most kids went into Monroe. Um, you know, there was this sort of um, culture already set. Sure. At, at Bertram, the culture was you're going to succeed in business. It was high school for business affairs. Okay, you're yeah. going to succeed in business. You're going to succeed in legal. You're going to succeed, you know, um, the uh, expectation to dress well in school, sure. the expectation to come prepared. It was a different kind of setting. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and we had really good teachers, um, really, really good teachers there who kind of treated us, you know, my class again was pretty diverse. And they treated us all the same, with the same high, high level of expectations. Um, of course, I joined the softball team. Uh, of course, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. you know, had a really great coach, Mr. Cohen. Um, and, um, um, you know, I, I strived. I really strived. And it was um, at, Mer oh, a couple of things. Um, we had a teacher who I tried to uh, look for, find because he, I understand that he did a lot for Clinton High School um, mm -hmm. once he left Murray Bertram, but he was also one of the pioneers of like the Road Runners Club. Oh, okay. um, The running culture that started sure. in the 80s, you sure. know, 70s, 80s. And um, he taught a class in social studies called the History of New York. Mm -hmm. And for me, that was just fascinating, going back to New York history. So we yeah. weren't just listening, um, learning about the Marshall Plan, sure. you know, Manifest Destiny or anything like that. We yeah, were just yeah, yeah. also learning about New York. Wow. It was the first time I had heard about the Lenape, you know, Indians. Sure. It, it, it was, and we would do walking tours of the of lower... Manhattan and all kinds of things. So I think he sparked my interest in sort of um, local history. Sure. Um, and and you know that was that was really great. But then the other thing that happened to me at Bertram was because I joined, you know, I um, signed into sort of the legal studies program. There, um, I was uh, assigned to intern with the assemblymen of my district in the South Bronx. Okay, yeah. And that happened to be, his office happened to be located right above the supermarket that we went to all my life. Wow. So it was just in my neighborhood. Sure. Um, and I, you know, was never really um, exposed to politics in that way. Sure. Um, but I interned for uh, Mando Montano and uh um, what do I say? The first thing that they threw me with was constituent affairs. Oh wow! Managing all the people, you know. And at that time, you look out the window of uh, what we called Monty's office, sure. and the Southern Boulevard, and all of the buildings were burnt out. Wow. You know, so at that point, the Bronx was pretty much destroyed, and people were coming in with all sorts of housing issues. A lot of senior citizens would come in. A lot of people had different kinds of problems and they just threw me in there to figure out how to solve those problems wow. and um, and I really loved the work sure I really loved the work um, and then um, when the summer came around and my internship uh, you know um, was paused they hired me and they taught me how to collect petition signatures for wow. the petitions for races wow. and it turned out that I was really good at um, once the petitions were collected on the other side, sure. um, I could decipher the fake signatures. Wow. You know, okay. so, um, so Monty took 
good advantage of that yeah. and would just have me there. Like, where are you going? And I'm like, well, it's the end of my work day. He's like, no, 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 you stay here and you're going to finish looking at all these signatures and tell me which ones are the good, sign you know, the wow. bad signatures. So, um, so I became what he would call me my pe the petition technician to try to get the other side, you know, knocked off the ballot. Sure. Um, but then, you know, uh, I began... What he did was he um, he would call me into his office um, during any of his meetings so that I could learn. He sure. would, you know, um, a pretty strong guy, but would tell me, just sit there and learn. Don't yeah. say anything. Just sit here and listen to me. Look at what we do and hear what we And then eventually from there, then he had me write letters on his behalf. Like he was, um, he was really um, committed to making sure that I learned something about how the assembly works and sure. how laws were written and how people were served. Sure. Um, you know, that was an incredible experience that I'll never forget. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Did, did you think at the time that you might get into politics or, no. or law or anything like that? No, no. Yeah. But, you know, I was always sort of like the, uh, the volunteer chosen in schools to help other kids. Sure. You know, I would tutor kids and there were other things that I, the schools would always have me do as a kid. So it just it came natural, yeah. you know, the constitu the constituency um, affairs part of it. Um, but no, no. But then um, by the time I got to my junior senior year, he said to me, and so did my other teacher at Bertram. They said you're going to go to Albany. Okay. Yeah, you know, apply yeah. to Albany. Yeah. You're going to Albany because you're going to you're going to write laws with me in Albany. <laughs> and he was very. Um, unfortunately, because of redistricting, yeah. he lost the election. Uh -huh. I see, I see. And. Um, you know, um, I, I I worked for other elected officials after that, but um, the experience I had with him as a young woman, you know, 16, 17, 18, yeah. with Monty was, was just incredible. Wow. Mm -hmm. You know, going door-to-door -door -door knocking, which I loved. Sure. Um, you know, um, it was different. Uh, just recently, I, um, I'm part of a petition drive to uh, get the Department of Transportation to um, install some kind of safety measure on my block, traffic measure. Yeah. And, um, you know, I approached everybody that walked by and some neighbor came up to me and said, how do you do that? How do you just walk to anybody? You <laughs> and I said, well, I think I've learned this from, you know, from many years yeah, yeah, ago. Yeah. I've just learned to knock on anybody's door. Sure, yeah. absolutely, yeah. yeah. It's a very yeah. intimidating thing to do at first. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, wow, wow. So, uh, at this time, you know, in some parts of the Bronx, of course, what we can now call like, er, you know, early hip hop parties, even though the word wasn't being used at the time, were taking place. Was there anything like that going on in your neighborhood, or were you aware of? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, all the guys, you know, the, from what I remember, it started with all the guys hanging out in basements yeah you know uh with the music so kind of the music changed and then next thing you know um people were having um uh what do you call them uh they were having parties during the day oh hooky parties hooky or? parties yeah thank you yeah, yeah. people were having hooky parties sure and uh Again, my dad would not allow, you know, if I got caught, forget, forget it. Forget about it. Yeah, yeah, my sister and I got caught. Um, that was it. So we didn't really, I think I went to a hooky party once or twice, like right after school, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, when it was basically dead. But that's when I began to see the dancing and the guys doing the steps. Um, sure. And, you know, we were learning the steps as well. Um I try to do them now and yeah. because of my knees. It's hard, but um, um, yeah, you know, and then all of a sudden these parties branched out into the parks. Yeah. And so, you know, memories of St. Mary's Park. Sure. With all the, you know, the loud music and people hanging out, um, especially on Fridays and Saturday nights. Yeah, you know. yeah, yeah. Uh, the summer, it was. I'm sure. It was, you know. A blowout during the summers um, and um, friends that I knew were just totally committed to it yeah yeah totally yeah. committed to it um, yeah and then um, when I um, I got to college it was all about stepping but sure. for me the stepping was a, a kind of like a, a it was rooted in this hip-hop 
thing. You know, I know stepping came first, but very few people were kind of like stepping wasn't. It was revived, I think, as yeah. a result of the the hip hop culture. Yeah. But oh yeah, no, I remember um, people taking. Uh, there was a even up 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 from where I lived uh, in Christ the King High School on the mm -hmm. Grand Concourse. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. They had. Um, uh, hip hop parties you know sure. where guys would blast and they would uh, rhyme and and do all that kind of thing and it would just be jam packed like wow. you could not you know it would scare me sometimes because you could not like move, move there, right? or, you yeah. know everybody was just like hey oh hey um, <laughs> um, yeah yeah but it was a lot of fun yeah it was a lot a lot of fun yeah yeah um and even though it eventually became associated with, with hip hop, of course, graffiti came first, really. Right. And yeah. you, do you want to talk about, um, well, before we recorded, you, you were mentioning a brother's friend. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about your experience of graffiti in the neighborhood mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. any, anywhere around the Bronx in New York, actually? But. Yeah, I mean, you know, my take on the graffiti, which was interesting, is that um, uh, mainstream media. Um, characterized it as a crime, sure, right? Sure, sure. Um, people tagging the subways, because I think that um, as people tagged buildings and signs around the neighborhood, it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. But then when it grew to the subways, um, uh, then it became like this fight uh, uh, between government and the graffiti artists yeah um and they're kind of chasing uh the guys um and uh so then it became uh like clandestine yeah. you know this clandestine behavior and you know we knew who the graffiti artists were on the block and uh it was just fascinating uh just when i remember when they would come some of the guys would come from um the paint stores sure. and have the the cans of paints in their knee <laughs> jackets yeah. you know they were just like always All come up, you kind of yeah. knew um but we had one friend that was very close to my family um a good friend of my brother's um his name is nelson and as a young man he started uh you know doing graffiti and uh tagging his name everywhere and um uh, he would come to the house um, and every once in a while, I mean, I remember the first time he tried to teach us how to do block lettering oh, and how to do sure. graffiti in my house. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. But um, uh, he would, be, his parents were strict too, but he would, and, well, even though my father was strict, my mother was not strict. Yeah, right? yeah. And so uh, when the kids would hang out in my house, he would come to my house with his hands just completely covered in um, blue and black, lots of darkness in his hands, um, always in his, with his hands in his pockets and then come to my house and then um, my mother would allow him to wash his hands in the sink. Sure. And, and um, uh, yeah, but he did graffiti for so a long time. He went by the name of Stone. Okay, and yeah. So we saw Stone in the neighborhood um, and, you know, we would hear his stories about um, him running to the yards and you know running from the police and yeah you know needing to go back the next day to finish his his work sure you absolutely mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna see if i can find um any any photos of his tag anywhere mm -hmm. from back in the day i'll mm -hmm. let you know if i do okay yeah yeah <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, one time i was hospitalized and um he came to see me in the hospital and uh his hands were in his pocket and he was completely covered in paint. And I remember, you know, thinking he couldn't even wash himself before he came to see me. But, you know, that was his life. For sure. His life was, you know, painting and, and doing his artwork. For sure. Um, so, you know, uh, we kind of had, I guess in the neighborhood, you know, you had that again, you know, nothing's always um, like here or there, right? Yeah. It's It's, there's a... Uh, a combination of uh, of feelings, right? We knew he was doing that. We knew it was illegal. Sure. We knew that the that the city viewed it as something that was sort of anti civil, right? Sure. It was criminal. Um, but at the same time, um, 
that was where young people and including Nelson and other young people could express themselves, you sure. know, and I also, I talk about this all the time that, you know, we needed ways, we needed that valve yeah. to express our, ourselves. I think that graffiti, hip hop, music, all of the creative, um, uh, you know, um, um, uh, the creativeness that you see now or saw then was a response to our lack of creation you know sure. at some point we had art in schools yeah or we and didn't have that when we had music I mean my brother learned how to play music in his school my, my two brothers are musicians yeah and my sister is an artist she's an art high school art teacher wow. and they learned the arts yeah in school um, and, and then next thing you know, all those art programs were gone. Was, was that the case when you were going through? Was it kind of gutted like right as you were coming it through was, or right after you? It was gutted as we were going through. Wow, it was yeah. gutted. Um, by the time I left middle school, it was pretty much gutted. You know, wow. so, so like I never really had the opportunity to play an instrument in IS-52 oh, okay. where wow. my brother learned how to play but I had chorus. So yeah. we had, you know, they kept something and yeah. we, they kept chorus, um, but we didn't have the extent of the art programming that they had. Sure. Um, and um, nor did my brother or my younger yeah. sister. Um, and, wow. Mm -hmm. and I think that's like such an important part of understanding what is going on in the Bronx in the 70s because when you think of hip hop, you think of graffiti, those are completely, you know, do it yourself. Like, you know, with hip hop, people invented this thing working with what, you know, what they were able to get their hands on. Mm -hmm. Same with graffiti. You know, it's not like people could get, you know, expensive paintbrushes or easels or this or that. They go to the hardware store, they get what they can get because all of the resources were completely yeah. taken away yeah. that other people, other kids were enjoying, you know. Sure, and, sure. Yeah. I mean, that includes uh, both my parents uh, when I was very young received their GED, their sure. General Currency Diploma, in school. Yeah. Um, my mother went through a training program that got her eventually a job to become like a, an administrative aide, um, working for a, an insurance company. Um, and my brother participated in the Boy Scouts. Sure. And um, I went to camp to yeah. the Fresh Air Fund. Um, and, you know... We participated in certain things in elementary school, yeah. which was the 70s, the early 70s. Sure. And then by the late 70s, those programs were gone. All gone, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. You know, wow. except UBP. Sure, right, of except course. UBP. Of course. So UBP stepped in, but um, those programs in schools were gone. After school programs were basically um, eliminated. Sure. Um, and um, yeah. Yeah, and so what do you do? You know, you still have young people who want to express themselves yeah. and create and explore. And, you know, so that was it. Yeah. It exploded. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and yeah, you know, it's, it's so interesting because most, most of the time you see, of course, poor and working class people depicted, whether it's in, you know, kind of the mainstream media or, you know, a lot of movies, TV shows, like it's purely in the most tragic terms possible. But to me, what makes Bronx history so amazing is you can't ignore just how, excuse my French, but fucking creative, mm -hmm. like these children of poor and working mm -hmm. class people mm. are. I mean, it's, it's just amazing yeah. to me. Yeah, I mean, I think that, um, as I said before, my mother used to um, sew the costumes yeah. for the plays, right? So uh, we had plays every year in elementary school. We had performances, you know, the, the school administration, by the way, which was run by, at the time, the principal was Albert G. Oliver, oh, who okay. started the Albert G. Oliver program, which helped kids get into prep school, right? Sure. Um, uh, you know, there was always a talent show. Yeah. There was always, and I remember the after school programs in elementary school where yeah. we would practice or, you know, uh, uh, 
I remember my sister, uh, you know, uh, what do you call those little flutes? Oh, recorder. The recorders. Yeah. My sister and my brother performed at uh, Carnegie Hall, wow. you know, at that time. I mean, there was always something happening. And it wasn't like, um, um, not, I shouldn't say like that. I should say, and it was very much embedded in all of who we were sure. so you know uh african culture puerto rican culture like all of this yeah. um was brought together my uh third grade teacher used to bring in her irish fireman husband to do stuff with us and she always taught us about irish culture because she was just like completely <laughs> irish you know loved her culture but it was just something that we kind of all um, embraced. Sure. Now, this is t t I'm telling you this from the, the lens of a young child. Yeah. But, you know, nevertheless, it was impressionable to me. And, and, you know, it kind of made me grow into someone who is, you know, uh, I like to embrace diversity, Absolutely. you know, because I, I grew up in that, Absolutely. right? And I see the value of it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, you fit, you're finishing high school and um, and you know I, I guess your your move at that point is to is where, where all are you looking as far as as far as colleges go or what what all were you considering at the time as mm -hmm. far as um, you know where you might go after high school yeah I mean it's interesting um, I would say that I don't think that I operate it from the the viewpoint that I had a lot of options sure, sure, even sure. even then you know I so I had I basically I think that I applied to CUNY I applied I don't know where I applied to CUNY I don't remember uh, maybe Lehman or something sure. I applied to um, Albany and I applied I applied to Russell Sage College which is in Troy New York okay. because my sister went there oh, okay, and okay, that I see, was yeah. because she went there and I don't know how she got there I decided I was gonna go to Russell Sage um, to follow in my sister's footsteps. Sure. But like I said, Monty and my uh, my um, teacher, Mr. Cummings, they said, oh, no, 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 you're going to Albany. Yeah. And they just told me where I was going. And I said, okay. Yeah. You know, um, my only objective was to get out. Sure. To leave. And, to, you know, so Albany sounds good. Um, I never step foot in Albany we didn't do like what I did with my own children yeah. visit colleges you know go to information sessions sure. I met a counselor in Albany during one of these college fairs at Columbia University and then you know submitted my application and then got in um, really not knowing you know just not having any um, any picture of my future you sure. know just like big risk for me because a yeah. lot of my friends were not yeah. going away yeah. at the time um, and I didn't really know what I was getting myself into you know it was sure. a pretty scary prospect at that time I'm sure mm -hmm. I'm sure yeah and I, I imagine that uh, it was an adjustment to say the least mm -hmm. um, you know just being around I can't imagine there are too many students um, necessarily you know from New York City or from the Bronx that you interacted with, yeah. what, were the, what were the students like? There were students, you know, Albany at that time had a, what's called an EOP program, mm -hmm. Educational Opportunities Program, where sure. they um, bring in, it's a different admissions path to get in, um, and the uh, eligibility requirements is that of like um, income, and um, the grades don't have to be like 90, so I think my grade was like 80 something, so sure. I got in and then, then by virtue of our income. I was able to get in and there were a bunch of students oh, okay. who came in through that okay, program although we would joke that we were a bunch of ink spots oh, okay, in the, okay. you know because we were I think less than like I don't know nine percent of the student population sure, right but there sure, were sure. students of color students from the Bronx students from Brooklyn and um, who were students of color and there were um, you know like black sororities and um, there were already uh, student groups of kids led by kids of color like sure. Asuba and Fuerza Latina and, sure. and stuff so that you know it had um, its groups of, uh, of young people of color nevertheless it was a culture shock yeah it was a culture shock not just for me but for many of us sure. um, 
uh, yeah, you know, it was a culture shock uh, in different ways, not just music, but in like behavior and um, one, I mean, one simple way, right? With looking it through like the eyes of a college student, for me in the South Bronx, like, South Bronx kids didn't go drinking at bars. Yeah. That wasn't a culture that yeah. we, you know, uh, lived. We didn't go drinking at bars. We drank in the park. Yeah. We went to the park. We got uh, Old English, you know, bottles of Old English or whatever, night train. And uh, then we went to the park and we drank it. Hope For me, it was hoping that my dad never caught me yeah. doing that, right? <laughs> yeah. But um, but we didn't go into bars. Yeah. Bars was something that, I don't know, other people did. I don't know. So yeah. that was one thing. Like going... Sure. Or just like, for example, going to parties. That yeah, was big. Yeah. Everybody stood around, drank and talked. Yeah. Where was the dancing? <laughs> so you go to Albany, right? And the biggest difference between parties of kids of color and the parties of the white kids was yeah. that everybody was standing and dancing and talking. And in, uh, you danced. Yeah, for You sure. just danced. And, sure. you know, you drank a bit, you, whatever people drank and smoked. But... It was mostly all dancing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was a big difference. Um, For sure. Yeah. Um, um, in my freshman year, uh, my roommate, who had a who whose mother was an assistant principal of a school in the South Bronx, I don't think she ever told me, or I don't remember. Um, my roommate one night told me that uh, her mother said I wasn't gonna make it. She said it flat, you know, she told me flat, oh, my mother said, you're not going to, you're going to fail. And I said, what? You know, I was like, what? Surprise. Wow. And then she explained, because I was coming from a South Bronx school. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, I don't think she realized the impact that she had or the, the, the way that that message was just something that it was so negative. Absolutely. You know? Um, and I'm sure she told plenty of students at this, the school she was principal that same thing, probably. Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, it, it turned out that at the end of that year, she failed and she had to leave, oh, okay, which yeah. is weird. But, you know, it kind of gave me like, oh, all right. Yeah, um, not harbor. that I've harbored any bad feelings <laughs> sure, for her, but sure, it was sure. just that. And then, I mean, I think another difference was, which was interesting was that um, the, 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 I think that there was a good number of kids who were middle class kids whose parents were able to pay for college education. Sure. And one of the things that we noticed was that during um, um, lunch or dinner in the cafeteria sometimes the white kids would play and throw food and we were incensed by that like the kids of color just because we were poorer yeah we we were just so grateful Absolutely. that we got the food i mean i just remember being in these you know in in these groups where it was just like what are they doing they're yeah. throwing food around how could you know, I know. how could that Oh my God, um, where, you know, we, we couldn't do that. Yeah. We, you know, food was a little bit um, kind of like too precious in that, you For know, sure. from, the neck of, from where we stood as poor people, right? Absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, those were some of them. And then the other difference, of course, is that um, at the beginning of, although, you know, I must say that I got a 4.0 my first year, but then after that, um, I never felt like I was adequately prepared academically. Mm -hmm. Like I, I felt, and, and a lot of my friends did too, that we had to really work hard to make the grade sure. because college was hard. Yeah. And, um, and um, um, for as much as I was a model student yeah. in, throughout all my years in school, including Mary Bertram, when I got to college, I had struggled. Sure. I struggled academically because of um, because I didn't have the kinds of writing or reading skills, analytical skills, that um, a lot of my other white peers had. Absolutely. You know, yeah, and yeah, yeah. and and for a while, you know, I always thought it was me or it's us. But then you realize that it was the education system. Yeah. That didn't prepare us. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And obviously through that and through the fires being a regular experience in your childhood and through all of the other kind of, you know, parts of the context of your neighborhood that you mentioned, I mean, you clearly experienced 
racism at a huge structural level at that, but and do you want to talk more about your experience of, um, you know, racism growing up, either, you know, when did you become aware of being treated differently or, you know, particular experiences, individual experiences, mm -hmm. things like, things like that? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that's a good one because I don't think that I experienced, uh, we experienced that much racism because we were kind of like in a bubble. Sure. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we could tell that there was this unequal system yeah. when we saw the Brady Bunch or when my dad would take us to Palisades Amusement Park. It was oh, a, an amusement okay. park that no longer huh. uh, exists in Palisades um, on the other side in Jersey. We could see the difference. Sure. Um, uh, it, it, it's okay to talk about it now, but my sister Marcy um, had a teacher in elementary school who would take my sister away on the weekends, not every weekend, but on occasional weekends, yeah. several times a year, my mother would allow her to take um, Marcy. Sure. And, uh, you know, nobody thought anything about it. It wasn't like, you know. And uh, one time they invited me to come and I was just so excited. I was very little. Yeah. And it was like the first time I saw a suburb. Like I, oh, okay. I experienced being in a suburb and, yeah. you know, neatly cut green grass and a house with two levels and yeah. you know um i thought oh my oh my god you know and and so we kind of knew that was in the background sure. um of it um i think that um my sister one time told us that we were poor and i was surprised i was like we're not poor yeah yeah. She goes, yeah, look at, look at, you know, look at Mrs. So-and-so, look at Mrs. So-and-so, look at what we see on TV. We're poor, we're yeah. different. Um, and, and I think that that opened my eyes. I think that um, we kind of, in my household, we kind of, um, in a subtle way, saw how my dad was frustrated in sure. his own life and his career. My dad played um, minors for the Indians, the Cleveland oh, Indians. Oh, wow. And um, he, I don't think, I mean, I think that what we heard, you know, in, 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 when he would talk about it was that he had never got a shot, like he never got a shot to play. Yeah. Um, and then my father was also into theater at some point or acting or doing something, mm -hmm. but he could never get a shot either. You know, so I think that my father was kind of frustrated with a person who wanted to move beyond becoming a linoleum salesman, sure. you know, installation type person to doing something more with his career. Yeah. And I don't think that he felt that he could, you know, um, he could go for further. So I think that those were the hints, sure. you know, sure. um, then when I went to high school, uh, I think it was my second year high school again because I had joined like the legal studies program yeah. um, New York State or New York City it must have been New York City they had what's called mock Congress mm. and um, I was identified uh, I along with like three other uh, classmates we were identified to participate in this mock Congress and uh, we each had to uh, in preparation we had to uh, write a bill and submit a bill to this Congress so that it can kind of be discussed and whether it passed or not. Sure. And um, so, of course, my bill was to rebuild the South Bronx. Sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wrote this bill like, we need to rebuild the South Bronx. Yeah. And um, Mr. Cummings helped me with the bill. Um, so he's like, okay, you're going to do this. It's going to be great. And then um, it was a, a, a sleepover, like a weekend thing. Yeah. And so we, we go there and um, I am staying in someone's house um, of another student who lived, in, this was um, Staten Island, I believe, and we, you know, I lived in this person's house or, you know, as a guest. And um, the young woman would not talk to me. She just like looked at me in disgust that Friday when, when I got there, she was like, I'm like, okay. So, you know, I, yeah. Like my mother said, you represent your family, you make the bed, you, you know, you, you're very polite, you sure. know, but whatever. So I was just really, really 
kind of like um, on edge, afraid to touch anything um, in her house. And so, you know, that was okay. The mother would talk to me. Then Saturday morning, we, um, we, you know, we get to this big school and we're all, you know, there are all these ceremonies anyway. So the time comes for me to present my bill and I didn't present it. Someone on the floor, oh, some okay. student um, on the floor. And he took the bill and it was in two pages, I remember. Yeah. He took the bill, he read it. He said, to rebuild the South Bronx. And he threw it on, he just went, all right, that's it, next. Wow. And I sat there in the audience of the students, like flabbergasted, shocked, hurt, disappointed, but I had to keep my composure, like, yeah. okay, yeah. I've got to like stay professional about this. And then, wow. um, you know, just hung on until it was time to go and then we came home, you know, we came back and, um, you know, Mr. Cummings were all, was all excited that Monday and he said, okay, so what happened? And I told him and he said, he said, ah, fuck them. <laughs> you know, he just told me like, ah, fuck them. And I'm like, oh yeah, but you know, that experience wow. just gave me, I think, a, a, a kind of entry into, um, uh, uh, what's the word like uh, you know uh, disinterest or indifference sure indifference sure you know like this is indifference and and I had not I was surprised by it yeah you know because again um, as a young child I participated in the fresh air funds sure. and in the fresh air fund camps most of the counselors were white like liberal hippies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I kind of grew up thinking that white people were hippie, nice, progressive, you know, sure, long sure. hair, that kind of thing. Sure, sure, and sure. And then as I got older, I began to realize that they're not all white people were the same. Yeah, yeah. And probably, <laughs> probably that was a very small minority of white people that. Right. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know, <laughs> yeah, did not have the exposure. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. All the yeah, rest. Yeah, that was. Yeah, you know, living. and our teachers, of course, you know, yeah. throughout. I think that, you know, on the one hand, we do hear right, and and I've worked in education for a long time that that um, teachers. Uh, do not place enough expectation on students of color, especially sure. kids of color, right? Sure. Um, we do hear that. On the other hand, I feel like I had some terrific white teachers growing up. Yeah. Maybe maybe they didn't have those expectations. Maybe, I don't know, but um, I can list to you some really wonderful white teachers that I've had over the years. Sure. Um, you know, so I never kind of boxed, like, people in, in, in negative ways, sure, quite frankly. Sure, sure, absolutely. It's also, well, infuriating and interesting to hear about the response to your bill, because that's literally what the response of the federal government was to any bills that have anything to do with yeah. providing funding to the South Bronx. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, that, yeah. It kind of mirrored. Yes, he sure did. Yeah. I remember yeah. being really surprised by that. Wow. By that wow. act. Yeah. Wow. Um, so, speaking of rebuilding, um, you're at SUNY Albany. Mm -hmm. Were you, at, at what point while you were there, it, when, when did you decide you wanted to come, uh, you know, come back to the Bronx eventually? Was that at SUNY Albany or was that later? I think it was, it was while I was studying at SUNY Albany. Yeah. Um, I think that because of the culture shock, um, you know, many of the students, um, uh, the African American and Latino students, you know, African Caribbean students, and sure. we all banded together. And SUNY had like an African American studies program, yeah. had a Latino American studies program, and so you know, I began to take courses. And and also because of Monty, you know, the assemblyman, sure. he said, "Oh yeah, you're gonna go there and you're gonna you're gonna major in political science." And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> so I started taking political science courses, and sure. I. I started also, I took, um, uh, I focused on political science, I focused on Latin American studies, and I also focused on women's studies. Okay, wow. Yeah, um, yeah. Feminism, intro to feminism studies, a lot of feminist courses. And, uh, um, you know, uh, we had one particular professor in the Latin American studies department that uh, began to uh, give us insight you know through the coursework we got we gained insight I gained insight into 
the issues that the Puerto Rican community was facing. So it wasn't just like, oh, the Puerto Ricans are, you know, poor. But sure. we actually dug into research, data, history, Absolutely. and that became very compelling to me. Sure. You know, the learning of that was very compelling to me. Learning of the history of African Americans in this country became compelling to me. Women became compelling to me. Yeah. And then I realized, oh, wow, I got to do something about this. Like I want to go into either education or I want to learn about my culture. I want to um, go into politics. So while I was at SUNY Albany, I actually was very active. I was a very, very student, uh, you know, activist. Um, sure. So, you know, everything from apartheid to actually um, I was recruited to um, advocate against 21, the drinking age, because okay, at, yeah. at some point, um, the state assembly, you know, put in a bill to raise the drinking age to 21. And I, the, all the white activists wanted me involved so that I could also, um, advocate, uh, or lobby, uh, the, the black and Puerto Rican caucus sure. <laughs> <laughs> because they wanted some Latino representation. So, yeah. but, but I didn't really care about yeah. the 20, the drinking age. I was drinking anyway. Yeah, I mean, sure. didn't. Anyway. Um, so I became very active and very political on campus, um, doing all kinds of things. And, you know, we brought up, like we held the demonstrations to bring up Grandmaster Flash. And we oh, brought wow. up, for the first time, we brought up El Gran Combo, we, wow. you know, and doing, we had sit-ins because someone said something racist in the school newspaper. Sure. And, you know, um, you know, there were fights about getting like black hair care products sure. on the shelves of sure. this college store. and. Um, you know, things of that nature, everything to me became a problem and I needed to fight, sure. um, you know, um, so eventually what began to happen was that my grades began to suffer because, you know, I'd go to class and then I, I was actually, um, SUNY Albany created a position for the first time in the student association. It was called the minority affairs coordinator and okay. I became the first of, you know, selected for that. Sure. Um, and so I was, you know. 10 hour a week job yeah. within the student association structure but man I was there till 11 o'clock at night doing I'm like sure. fighting and doing all kinds of things and um, eventually my grades began to suffer and the vice president of minority affairs for the college called me into his office and he said to me Vivian the most political thing you can do is graduate. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, you know, you're running around, you're doing all of this, you're fighting, you're doing affirmative action, you're on this committee, you're on that. Sure. You need to get yourself together. Yeah. And, and actually, that's what I did. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. And then, you know, after that, I knew I was coming back. You know, by that time, I knew I was coming back. Yeah. And I wanted to, um, I actually wanted to run for office because, you know, that's what Monty told me I should do. But then eventually I realized that that wasn't the life. For sure. Me. Sure. I didn't want to do that. And were, were your parents uh, and younger siblings at the same apartment still? While no, you were at SUNY? no, no, no. While I was at SUNY, uh, my parents divorced, or my parents, um, my mother left, and okay. she moved to Puerto Rico. Okay, sure, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, so, um, yeah, my mother was in Puerto Rico, and my dad had left, and um, and um, I hadn't seen my parents in quite a while. Like, wow. I, I saw the least of my parents while I was in college. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, and so when you came back to the Bronx, uh, where did you, where did you move to first when you came back? Mm -hmm. hmm. I moved to Creston Avenue. Oh, okay. Um, not, uh, on like by uh, 184th street, sure. which is, um, a little south of Fordham road. Yeah. Um, and I remember the first thing I did was walked into that school that was uh, two blocks away from there on Field Place and asked the principal if I can volunteer, and he told me no. Oh, wow. So now I just graduated, I want to volunteer, I want to tutor, and he told me no. Um, but before then, um, while I was in, at SUNY Albany, I think it was the third summer of my junior year, I interned for Assemblyman Jose Rivera. Oh, so oh, I had wow, already okay. been connected to, you know, again, doing political campaigning, sure, uh, petitions, sure. <laughs> getting out the vote. Um, and so he had me doing that. And so when I came back, um, I think I did a little bit of, of that work as well. Yeah. Um, but realizing that I wanted 
I needed to figure out what to do when I got back. I needed to make money, so I worked for, um, I actually worked for one of these private educational schools. Oh, okay, okay. Um, that back in the um, 80s, um, you know, uh, I think it was TCI, they were kind of just robbing people, you know, and mm -hmm. um, enrolling young people into these programs and not really, you know, a lot of young people um, dropping out and then having to pay, sure. um, you know, tuition for services really not rendered. And so I did that for several months, or maybe for nine months, and then um, I ended up actually suing them through the State Department of Labor because wow. they wouldn't pay me wow. my, you know, we got paid via commission. Sure, sure. And um, I got a lot of people in, and they didn't want to pay me, so eventually I, I had to sue, and I got my money back through they the state. They didn't know who they were messing with. with. Yeah, yeah, they, um, <laughs> um, which was really fascinating. Um, um, uh, in my last semester of SUNY Albany, um, I traveled to Costa Rica mm -hmm. to do anthropological field research. Oh, wow. And... Um, and visited Nicaragua. And so we were in Costa Rica really looking at the impact that the Del Monte company had on the society, the community of uh, where they had a very big pineapple farm. Sure. And so um, uh, that was a fascinating um, experience. Coming back from Costa Rica, um, I met someone who, uh, uh, convinced me, influenced me, suggested that I apply to the Coral Foundation, Coral mm -hmm. Fellows Program. I don't know if you know about that program, but they work with graduates, postgraduate students in, uh, in policy. Oh, okay, so it's like okay. a policy fellowship. Sure. Um, and that fellowship, uh, it provide, it's a 10 month long, long program where fellows uh, work as interns for about six weeks in the different sectors of public policy. So sure. they're nonprofit, media, um, corporate, union. So, um, you know, I worked at a nonprofit, Banana Kelly, yeah, yeah. Um, for six weeks and, and did some interesting work for them. I worked for a media company. I worked actually, um, that was the year of the Rainbow Coalition campaign. So I, oh, like, sure. Yeah, so I worked on the um, Gephardt. It, this was a an elected official from Long Island who one of the it was like the seven Democrats who were running Jesse Jackson Dukakis Gephardt uh, oh I forgot the other guys I mean there were a whole bunch of people running sure. for the Democratic ticket for the president presidential Democratic ticket so I ended up working in Long Island everybody wanted Jesse Jackson we were twelve fellows I yeah. got Gephardt. Um, <laughs> Uh, I worked for the New York Telephone Company and I uh, worked for a union um, and that was just pretty fascinating because I sure. got in, in a look at all the different how policy works in all these different sectors yeah. um, and um, yeah that was that was quite fascinating yeah absolutely mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. absolutely and well, you know again the other thing about that um, so yeah one of the things that um, I think is, well, infuriating to think about, but also, I mean, a very important part of um, Bronx history is even in neighborhoods that were hit hardest by, um, by arson, it still seems like there were, you know, very strong, or at least pretty strong community ties considering everything that people were having to go through. Mm -hmm. But then comes the crack epidemic. Mm -hmm. um, and you, I, I was wondering if you wanted to talk about your experience mm -hmm. of um, of that coming back to the Bronx. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Is this on? Yeah. Okay. Because I don't see a light. There was a light before. You sure. Yeah. It's okay. Recording. All right. Yeah. Okay. So um, I think that during my junior year, I came back to visit my neighborhood in the South Bronx, and um, I ran into a bunch of friends. One friend in particular who was a was well known as a amazing paddleball champion sure um you know i ran to him gave him a big kiss and a hug and asked him how he was doing 
and um, you know, in two to three minutes of the conversation, asked me if I wanted to do some crack with him. Yeah. Um, if I wanted to blow crack, and I said I was just shocked, and I realized, oh no, um, and you know, um, that experience was just. It, it took me off, but I knew about the crack, of course. It was already, you know, in the in the air. And people sure. were, but I had not met anybody yet that I knew because I was away at, at Albany. Yeah. Um, that was um, into crack. And then when we moved to Creston, when I moved to Creston, um, crack was everywhere. Crack okay. was all over the neighborhood. Wow. Um, and, you know, eventually, I began to hear people who were into crack, people who, you know, being warned, don't trust so and so person because yeah. crack will, you know, has driven them crazy yeah. and they will take everything you have. Like, don't let people. I mean, one time I, I saw another friend who I was really good friends with, you know, back in the day, and uh, I invited her to my apartment on Creston. Sure. And, um, she actually did crack in my apartment. Okay, yeah, 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 <laughs> You know, she went into the bathroom and, and I was stunned by it because I didn't think, you know, she didn't really think anything of it. She yeah. didn't think, you know, I'm seeing Vivian, I haven't seen Vivian in five years or whatever, and now she just walks in, goes to the bathroom and, and did crack and then asked me for money. And wow. then I thought, oh my God, this is really bad. Um, you know, so yeah, after the destruction of our infrastructure, right? The fires and all of that. Now people are being destroyed, like their bodies, their complete, their bodies and their minds yeah. and their spirits are being destroyed and like uh, devastating. I know. You know, I know. Deathly ways. Yeah. Yeah. In, in ways that just weren't, weren't really that, that case with the heroin epidemic as, as, no. as terrible as that was. Like, right. Correct. Yeah. Correct. It's not that not the same. It was just like uh, you know, drugs uh, um, exponentially, and uh, you know, it kind of destroyed people. Like you know, what what people would talk about is that like you had the heroin addicts from back in the day, and people say they were harmless. Yeah. You know, they were just you know drug addicts. You left them alone because yeah. that was their you know their demon. But with crack, it was different. It was like they are harmful. Um, and they day. and they yeah yeah it consumes their lives they you know their health uh, just you know dwindles the family structure you know crack babies you know uh, destroyed a lot of families destroyed a lot of lives uh, and so did AIDS yeah, yeah, you know, yeah because yeah. once those two came in combination into the community um, it really did a number on the community, and you know, I um, uh, I think that when you come from a neighborhood like that, you know, you often go to too many funerals. Yeah. You know, I've had to go to a lot of uh, funerals in my life. Absolutely, absolutely. And were you um, had you already become involved in? Um, 52 people for progress by this point no, in time? No. no, I wasn't involved with 52 because I left and I lived on Creston. Um, I kind of was more involved with the National Congress of Puerto Rican Rights sure. for like, like a couple of years after I graduated. Sure. Um, joined uh, people from there, um, went to meetings, you know, became like the membership secretary, went to conferences and that sort of thing. Um, but it wasn't until I had begun working for Bronx Works. Sure. At that time, they were called Citizens Advice Bureau. Okay. And I went to a meeting downtown. Um, we were receiving funding for some project. And sitting next to me was a gentleman by the name of Al Quinones. And, um, you know, it just goes to show, right? I, we turned, we said, hello, where are you from? And I said, no, you're not from 52. I grew up in 52. Yeah. I went to 52. I don't yeah. know. You know, and I said, I remember you. I, yeah, you look familiar, but Al is several years older than me. Oh, okay. Okay, so sure. he wasn't in my kind of generation. Yeah. You know, um, and he stayed, he stayed, he never really came to Leggett. He stayed around Avenue St. John's and Prospect, that area. Sure. So um, the more we talked, the more we realized that we knew 
the same people we knew so and so what do you know this person you know that person yeah oh my god man and in the park and yeah yeah i used to play basketball i'm like oh well i didn't play basketball but i you know i played paddleball and so then um we went to lunch after that meeting um and then we just became friends ever since that and he recruited me to then um volunteer in the park sure. on the, you know the wednesday nights and then he asked me to serve on the board and then he asked me to look at things and um so i kind of became involved with 52 people for progress um in some really great and fun ways yeah mm-hmm. absolutely mm-hmm. absolutely yeah. um and what what kinds of things what was 52 doing at the time they were holding um uh concerts in the park so you know, 52 People for Progress started out beautifying. They took over 52 Park because it was a misarray. By the way, when I was um, young, we were in middle school. My my sister got uh, was bitten by a dog in 52 Park. Ooh. But if you could imagine, I mean, we love 52 Park, but it had like maybe two or three working swings that yeah. were crooked and broken. And to get there, you had to walk through all this brick rubble. Sure. And, you know, it was just um, a mess. You know, yeah. it wasn't um, what a park should look like. But nevertheless, that's that was our park. So yeah. we went there, you know. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, and, uh, uh, Al began to tell me stories about how they took over. That, you know, uh, one day they he looked at a park bench and said that park bench looks horrible. Yeah. So he went and painted one bench. And then next thing you know was feeling really excited by that and then painted a second bench and yeah. then started painting all the benches wow. and um, you know recruited people um, from the neighborhood to start cleaning up and start painting benches and, and you know um, they began to appeal to uh, the Department of Parks to fix the park and um, realized that uh, if they were going to if the park was going to change, it would have to be in their hands, and that they yeah. would have to change the park themselves. And so they empowered themselves to begin to work um, in the park and become committed. They, you know, um, created a beautiful garden and, sure. and then um, started appealing for funds to to make the park nice. So then eventually they brought concerts to the park because yeah. they, you know, Al and some of the other people on the on the team there realized that they needed to bring culture back yeah. to the neighborhood and that they you know one way to do it is to bring salsa and to get people dancing sure. and you know um you know al being a, a very um intelligent um salsa music historian that was perfect for him and so wow. he had the wherewithal to him to be friendly with all these salsa bands and and by the way, a lot of uh, salsa artists came from 52 in sure. that area. Sure. So he Absolutely. knew those musicians. Absolutely. I've heard, um, yeah. Yeah, and he also, you know, pressured them, cajoled them to come and play, a, you know, a, do a free concert in the park. Yeah. Um, and so eventually he got the funding and they beautified the park and they created a, you know, a amphitheater. And they, they were uh, providing concerts every Wednesdays. So I came in at the time that the, that was already in play, and I okay. would go and help with, um, you know, the raffles and, and things like that, and help, you know, clean the park afterwards. Sure. Um, I would bring my kids to the to the concerts, um, and uh, the uh, the joy was not just in volunteering for the park, but the joy was number one to see people dancing, yeah. see people joyous. Um, and the other part was uh, reconnecting with folks from the neighborhood that I hadn't seen in years. Definitely. You know, every year um, or every other year, they would have a reunion where they would invite everybody. You know, like on one particular day, and it was just one big reunion party of wow. folks that um, you know, people from Florida, from all over the place, Ohio, from Philly, would come, wow. and uh, you know, it was just so joyous to see people that I um, I hadn't seen in a long time you yeah know? yeah it was great wow so mm-hmm. were, there, were there do you want to talk about other either groups or individuals or buildings in your neighborhood that were kind of doing a similar thing like rebuilding literally on their own since no one else was 
you know, what else was rebuilding? Are there other kind of groups in the neighborhood like that? I mean, um, if you look at Banana Kelly, sure. right? Um, I interned for Banana Kelly in 1987. Um, and at that time, they were uh, very invested in maintaining the new buildings that they had acquired. Sure. Um, and um, uh, eventually I came to learn about the folks and the inspiration behind ba the Banana Kelly, the Potts family. Sure. You know, they're in our film. Sure. Um, Mr. Potts worked day in and day out. He, you know, through uh, savings, bought two buildings, three buildings, um, four buildings, and worked during the day at, in Hunts Point, um, maintained his buildings, but saw that everything was burning around him. Yeah. And that really he couldn't control what was happening. And so, um, you know, he and I met Harry DiRienzo, who sure. was doing social work, um, who was interning at Casita Maria at the time. Sure. And they got together and decided, along with some of the other guys, like, you know, um, Robert Foster, who's prominent in our film. Um, sure. And um, they got together and began to clean out some of the abandoned buildings and uh, take them over. Yeah. Um, they learned those lessons from, um, um, oh my God, uh, Rueda, Ramon Rueda. Oh, sure, yeah. Who did the same. Um, Ramon tells the story that um, he had been a, a, a student at NYU studying urban development mm -hmm. and he was walking through uh, the South Bronx along Washington Avenue yeah. one day and it was cold, it was on a cold day and he noticed that in one of the abandoned buildings he saw some movement on one of the upper floors. Mm -hmm. And he thought, wait, that's not a rat, that's, what is that? So yeah. he went up there and he found uh, an older woman um, living in the abandoned building um, with a makeshift like a electrical, uh, some kind of kettle with rags all over the floor. She had a coat on. And then um, he was, it kind of woke him up. That became his like catharsis. He, yeah. that he was like, wait a minute, we can't have people living like this. Yeah. So I think he helped her get some electricity. You know, at that time you could steal the electricity from the street. Sure, sure. Um, and then he found an elderly gentleman on one of the other floors and then decided, oh no, we have to take over this building. Yeah. So, you know, arguably um, people talk about how Ramon um, started the first homesteading movement in in the city or in the, the country sure they just he uh, summoned a couple of friends they took over the building and yeah. they started cleaning out that building um, for this lady and um, and so that other people could move in um, so banana Kelly learned about the work that Ramon had had done sure. and um, and the way that one of the ways in which they um, attractive people was through block parties, mm. right? That was that's a tradition in the city. Sure. Right? You have a block party back then, um, especially during the summer. Uh, an organization or a group of tenants can close a block for eight hours a day, sometimes twelve hours a day. Get the permit to close the block um, for the entire summer, and kids could play basketball or. Um, scalesies or hopscotch or sure. jump rope or whatever um, and um, and you know play music for the kids and so that was a way to attract people to the community sure. um, and to support people you know sure. to get to know who's on the block what's going on um, and and to share goals like hey we want to clean up this block we want to take this building can you help us? Yeah. So it became a way to recruit and inspire people sure. to take back their neighborhood. So, you know, you see that in the example of Ramon, but um, uh, you see that in the, the example also of UBP, you see sure. that in, in the example of Banana Kelly um, and other organizations and, and Hetty Fox oh, absolutely. did Hedy the Fox, same thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Hers was a one woman show. Sure, yeah. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, she did receive support, but she was really a one woman show. Yeah. Um, 
where she, you know, with her badass self said, no one's going to burn my block. And, yeah. and in fact, that block did not burn. I know. <laughs> um, you know, um, and she paid attention. And, um, you know, it was one of those Aung San heroes that used the block party method and continued to use it up until she became ill. Um, you know, always closed that block. Sure. For kids on, on in the summer. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and you mentioned in, in your building itself, the tenants eventually had to had to take it over and mm -hmm. install a boiler, and I mean, that's that's something that I've heard in a lot of buildings. Yeah. Um, and yeah, I, 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 I can't even imagine, I, I have no clue how to install a boiler, so yeah. I'm sure that was uh, yeah. a challenge. <laughs> yeah, they took over because the boiler broke, they had to get a new boiler in, and then they had to create a, um, a governance structure sure. so that somebody would collect, continue to collect the rent yeah. and uh, pay for the boiler and pay for the water and pay for the taxes. And then, um, you know, someone had to uh, respond to the maintenance needs. So they yeah. had someone, one of the, um, um, uh, the gentleman on the first floor, I forgot his name, um, Kiko's father, mm -hmm. um, who, you know, did the maintenance. Um, in the building and you know people are now then paying attention and uh, making sure that the building would function sure for its tenants mm -hmm. sure yeah 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 and then it became a co-op okay it became yeah. a co-op I was mm -hmm. gonna ask you if it became mm -hmm. a co-op wow yeah wow yeah 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 I mean mm -hmm. it's really it's really just incredible um, to hear you know people people had to do all of this Mm -hmm. some, some some might receive a little support or some grant money here or there, but for the most part, all on mm -hmm. their own. Mm -hmm. All on their own. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. 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 I mean, you know, um, I'm kind of like evolving my own um, sort of um, my notion of what resilience is because yeah. that is resilient work, attitude, um, ways of being. But how for how long can our communities be, be I know. resilient? I know, <laughs> right? For real, like I that know. was an unfair. Like, oh, they were so resilient. You know, we talk about it in ways that, but boy, it, it almost feels like they didn't have a choice. They didn't, and um, um, it wasn't fair. No, you know, not at all. No yeah. one else was having to do that. Right. Yeah. Right. And I doubt that many other people even could have done it. But yeah. Well, um, government failed them. Yeah. You know, the city of New York failed them. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so while you were experiencing all of this um, and, you know, in the context of uh, your childhood as well, did you, were, were you um, uh, like thinking about some of the, like, I guess, reasons for all of this taking place or were you just kind of in the moment at the time um were you able to um you know identify some of the uh some of the specific causes for all of this taking place at the time or has that become like a you know something that you've discovered more and more about over the years yeah i think it's the latter yeah. i discovered more about the uh, the lack of support resources um, uh, to the community after a while. Sure. Um, like I mentioned, you know, when you're a kid, you think it was it was just normal. Yeah. And you know, at some point, not of course, not everybody, but I think that there is this you know collective beyond the collective pain, a collective um, internalization of like we deserve this. This is who we are. You know, we're poor. Um, um, I think, which is why it explains some of the crime and the drugs, you know, yeah. cause it's really painful, but, um, but yeah, no, I just thought this is my, this is my community, you yeah. know, and, and at some points of, I, I was ashamed of it. I was ashamed of saying I was from the South Bronx, um, you know, and I got a couple of remarks about like, oh my God, you're from the South Bronx, especially like, oh, you carry knives or, you know, whatever. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah, I, I, the um, even when I like I knew my community um, needed support, which is why I wanted to go back sure. um, to help 
but I, ne you know, at that time, uh, I wasn't thinking about learning what happened to my neighborhood. Yeah. Like what? Why? Yeah. I was just moving forward. You know, sure. I wanted to have a career. I wanted to help. I knew that my career would be in supporting community. Um, you know, I got married, started to have children, and it, I was just moving forward. I wanted my kids to have a better life sure. than I did, so I, I really um, focused on education for them. Um, and um, yeah, I was moving forward. But then we began, and um, when I worked at Citizens Advice Bureau in the early 2000s, um, the Bill Gates Foundation um, uh, supported or funded the Department of Education to start small schools. Mm -hmm. That was sort of be the beginning of the small schools movement in New sure. York. Um, and that funding had a condition to the DOE that uh, every new small school that would be created had to be connected to a community-based organization. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, the, the funding was going to the community-based organization. Okay, I see. Yeah, um, yeah. And so there were all these kind of partnerships that were created. And sure. so we partnered with a new school. Uh, we helped create this new school, actually, at CAB, called the Community School for Social Justice. Okay, yeah. And um, before that uh, had happened, I had already um, hired a young woman by the name of Julia Allen, who grew up in New York, um, and um, uh, at the beginning stages, we wanted to teach the incoming ninth graders uh, Bronx history. Oh, okay, yeah. And so she, for the most part, I did some writing, but she did most of it, and uh, this other gentleman began writing a curriculum about the Bronx. And in that curriculum, they included graffiti, as a form of expression, yeah. um, hip hop as a form of expression, and the curriculum was um, taught was voted down, was not allowed yeah. to be taught because we were told graffiti was ugly and no, it was negative, blah blah blah, and this is you're not going to teach it. So we never ended up teaching the curriculum oh, in its totality. Some wow. yeah, some parts of it were taught, sure. uh, but not entirely. And in that process. Um, I think that that was what began to spark something in me about like, why, what happened? What yeah. really happened? And, you know, especially with Julia, who is an organizer now. She's a housing organizer and she was an educational organizer too for sure. so many years. But, you know, um, she began to ask me questions like, so how did you grow up? Yeah. What happened? She grew up on the Upper East Side. You okay, know? okay. So she was like, wait, and you had to like make sure you had shoes and you had fires and yeah. what? And you know, um, like whatever she was researching um, would would lead her to come back to me. Sure, so sure. Kind of like, <laughs> is this what happened? I'm yeah. like, oh my God. And then we would talk forever. Um, and so um, that's that's when I began to look at the history of the Bronx in a more critical way. Wow, you know, wow. And, and sort of like looking into more of the weeds, like what, sure. and then what happened with the fires? Sure. Particularly like, why did the Bronx burn? What happened? Yeah. It, we all knew it was arson, but you know, sure. the idea that, um, that public policy led the Bronx to burn was not something that was in my, you know, like in my, um, my headspace at that time. I know. You know, yeah, yeah. And what's really jarring to see, like, you 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 look at especially like in the late sixties, early seventies, you you look at some of what the major you know movers and shakers as far as city planning goes in New York are publishing in like the New York Times, and like they don't seem to have any shame at all in laying out the plan of, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, they, they call it by such nonsense names, you know, plan shrinkage, shrinkage but yeah. nine neglects, blah, blah, right. blah. But they're very clear that, you know, ultimately they don't give a damn about the people who live in the South mm -hmm. Bronx um, or places like the South Bronx, you know, mm -hmm. and it's, you read, you read, you know, it's like, it's right there in some of the New York Times, like opinion pieces. Yes. And it's like, oh my, like, how are these, how are these people not, you know, thrown in jail? Like, yeah. Um, yeah, one of the characters in our film, one of the people we talked to, John Finucane, mm -hmm. who um, you know grew up an Irish kid in sure. the South Bronx, 
um, when he became a firefighter, he tells us the story that he, one time they were putting out a fire and they were somewhere else. He was somewhere else. He wasn't in the South Bronx, but then he approached a, a person, uh, a press uh, person and said, why don't you go to the South Bronx? That's where you really need to go and cover the story. And yeah. they were like, oh no, we don't want to go there. Yeah. And he said that every time he would do a, you know, uh, be at a fire outside of the South Bronx, he would always approach these guys like, go to the South Bronx, cover that. Sure, sure. And that they didn't, you know, they would shrug him off like it wasn't important. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was, and it's so fascinating because as an adult, of course, as a kid, you see everything so big and far away, but we're not that far from Manhattan. Yeah. <laughs> you know, know. we're <laughs> that far from Times Square, or I mean, you know, Times Square had its issues, but you know, um, we weren't far off from the Upper East Side or the Upper West Side. Sure. We're not absolutely. that far, but there, you know, this explosion taking place. No. And um, it really garnered very little attention. Yeah. 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 Until you know, the Yankee game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then whatever attention it did garner, mm -hmm. you know, in almost all the news footage, you can just, in some cases it's just blatant, but in in other cases, you know, it's just barely even under the surface the contempt that um, that some of the reporters just have for the people mm -hmm. who live in the neighborhood. You know, mm -hmm. you can just sense it. Yeah. Um, and, you know, always questions trying to blame the situation on the yeah. people who live there. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. Right now we're working on a project about austerity. Oh, <clears throat> sure, sure, sure. Um, it's kind of like a, a, a piece of, there were sections of our film in Decade of Fire that people wanted to learn more about. Yeah. So w one of them was, how does this emergency financial control board thing work what is this economic strategy sure um, <clears throat> and so now we're kind of doing a short um, following how it kind of started in New York during the fiscal crisis yeah. and how it manifested itself in Detroit sure. with the water shutoffs which yeah. a lot of people a lot of people know about the poisoning of the water yeah. people don't know that over 140 families were their water was shut Without off water yeah, yeah. Um, and and how it's also now looking like in Puerto Rico mm -hmm. and, and that the, one of the, the threads of it is the blaming of the people, right? The blaming. Absolutely. So now, you know, people were blamed in Detroit as being lazy. That's why they're, they're not paying their bills, even though some bills were like, you know, a hundred dollars. People were late a hundred dollars yeah. and their water got shut off. But also um, in Puerto Rico, you know, this debt was created by the banks. Absolutely. <laughs> but the people are being blamed for the debt. Absolutely. <laughs> so Absolutely. it's this, this narrative of debt yeah. throughout our history yeah. that um, is still going really strong. And Absolutely. And, um, Sorry, that's oh, what yeah, I wanted to say. The narrative of blame. Of blame. And, <clears throat> you know, it's, well, I don't think interesting is the right word, but it's, uh, may, again, maybe infuriating is the right word to think about, you know, these measures of austerity and the strategies you know that now are at, at play all around all around the globe That's really right. like they were developed in the bronx among people who were displaced in the first place from you know u.s imperialism and i mean capitalism you know mm -hmm. or, or you know in the in the um in the uh, southern states and the u.s um you know kind of parallel things with jim crow and mm -hmm. All of that, like that's right. Yeah, people who are already displaced from you know older forms of U.S. imperialism now come to a place where this newer form is developed, and now it's exported around the globe. Right. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and you know it 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 does play. Um, you know, uh, I remember one time someone told me that exploited people don't have to be nice. To you, you know, and it, yeah. it just because it reminds me of, like even back then, you know, with the gangs, with what was going on, people were angry, yeah. you know, and, and people get angry with, um, or like if you look at the blackout, right? What was that about? Um, you know, did people need to have five shoes or ten shoes? And you know, in my viewpoint, um, I think there's a book by Sam Goodman on the 77 blackout and you know he tells constant stories like all the stories of um, folks who were involved and um, and 
and you know victim as well as perpetrator of the sure. of all the um, the break-ins. Um, but you know these are sort of like back then and the way I saw it and in reading that book, it's like stories of people who just are so frustrated, so it, it had not really nothing to do about whether people were good or bad or had ethics about stealing. It sure. wasn't about, you know, it wasn't about that. It was about the frustration Absolutely. that people felt at the time and especially young people, you know, having no way out. Yeah. Um, and just wanting to destroy something for to just get it out of the body, sure. you know. And I remember when I was a kid, um, around sixty two and fifty two, or in the in the rubble areas, we would throw stuff all the time. Yeah. You know, we were constantly throwing glass, throwing bottles. Of course, nowadays, would I allow? Did I allow my children to do that? Would I allow if I see a kid doing that? But back then, it was just a kind of like a way to just get it out. Sure. Get out the, the um, again, <clears throat> uh, being really clear that I didn't really know why I was angry. Sure, sure. You know, why we were angry, right? You know, um, um, but we used to throw a lot of bottles, not to people, but, sure. you know, against the walls. Yeah. We would do that. Um, and that, that was sort of like a... You know, um, it's like a, a a logical response to the illogical, the craziness Absolutely. that was going that we experienced. You know, the the um, the you know, it's like a war. You know, it was like a war zone, right? And it's just all this craziness, all these fires, and um, and it was just what we, how we managed to. Vent. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, besides the music and the hip hop, sure. And, you know. <laughs> sure, sure, sure. <clears throat> Absolutely. Yeah. And I, you know, I think you already mentioned it, but you know, definitely, I, I think that um, you know goes at least a long way in explaining um, some of the you know widespread struggles people had with drugs as well, because. Mm -hmm some cases that seems like the only way to survive on a day-to-day -day basis mm -hmm. um but uh but yeah um at any rate uh, uh do you want to talk some more about what kind of revisiting uh this history and you know uh, of course your personal experience is woven in through all of that in in the making of um uh, decade of fire and what's the question? Um, just what, <clears throat> what was your experience like, you know, going back to this oh, past? Yeah, it was, um, it was mixed. It was both um, delightful. Um, it conjured up just some wonderful memories and, sure. you know, wonderful people that I forgot about. Yeah. Um, and uh, took me back to the neighborhood time and time again. You know, we were able to... Um, uh, obtain permission to go back into the apartment right <clears throat> to go back into the apartment um, where I grew up and sure. just going back to my bedroom you know there were three of us three girls in one bedroom and just you know it was so delightful just remembering um, so many beautiful memories it was great um, but then learning about the uh, the injustice that was done uh, to our community, um, whether it was in the schools or whether it was on, you know, because of the fires, was very painful. It was sure. tough. It was a tough sure. journey. Um, and, you know, one of the ways in which it played out in making the film was that my partners, um, you know, we spent a lot of hours just interviewing me like we're doing now, yeah. right? Um, and talking about memories. But um, they would... Um, they would ask me some real specific question about a memory or something or um, ask me how I felt about some kind of policy. Yeah. And um, my reaction was, oh, oh, okay, so I would t start talking about it and then get start feeling emotional. Yeah. And then I would tell them to cut. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
and then they were like no 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 that's good stuff you know yeah. and i was like no 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 i'm from the bronx you're not going to see me vulnerable yeah i'm sure. not going to be because i spent a lot of years in my professional life and blah 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 not being vulnerable Absolutely. not i you know i don't want to come off as this angry south bronx person I don't want to come off as weak. I don't want to come off yeah. as this. And I've, you know, I've got to, like, you know, I've got to, no. and, um, and that was hard, sure. you know, to overcome, like to say, okay, I'm going to, and, and you see that in the film. I'm pretty yeah. Um, yeah. kind of like, not stoic, but I'm just pretty, you know, um, I'm not like angry. Or I'm not happy. I'm not like elated. It's just pretty it's much. Yeah. yeah, this is how it was um, because I didn't want to appear as that, and then eventually they got me when I went to that. <laughs> they got me when I went to the library. I know, I know. Um, yeah. <clears throat> you know, and and then you know, like at one point we wanted to cover some things that were painful, and I didn't want to cover it in the film. And so as di you know, co-director, I was like, no, we're not putting that in. No, yeah. we're putting this in, and you know that kind of thing. And and not that it was a, a problem because um, I have some great directors. Sure. You know, my partners, just awesome. Um, and you know, we were going to tell the story the way I wanted to tell the story. That Absolutely. was it. Um, but, um, um, the, at the Lehman archives, um, what I'm looking at, um, in, in that scene is, um, it, you know, you had mentioned this, that the press and the media, they weren't really paying attention to what was going on in the South Bronx. Yeah. But after a while, um, the then attorney, um, district attorney, Mario Marola, sure. um, had to place attention to it because he started getting pressure from the churches, yeah. a lot of the church groups in the South Bronx, like South Bronx churches and sure. stuff, and even some of the Manhattan churches. And so he began to um, appeal to Congress and to the FBI. So he began to write um, correspondence to anybody that would listen, like, please come here. We need to change some of this legislation to make arson a federal offense and blah, blah, blah. And um, what I was looking at is that, you know, this was by 1975, I think it was, um, despite his appeals, and he had gone to Congress already to testify yeah. and all of that, he, these letters were coming back from the FBI and, and the federal government that said, uh, we don't have any jurisdiction. Sorry, we can't help you. Sorry, we can't, you know, and in, in sort of their technical language, it was basically like, there's nothing we can do. And it sank me. Yeah. You know, at that moment, I was like, we know this is happening. It, yeah. You know, you could see it. And that's the response of that. It broke me. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. I and I was like, and, and there were times when I was just really, really angry. Like even at the... Um, local elected officials you know i began to blame the, the local politicians and i come to realize they didn't have any real power sure um it was beyond them yeah. you know and and there were politicians who were calling attention to it there yeah. were activist groups who were calling attention Absolutely. to it yeah. um you know um there are lots of people calling attention to it and then it was just um nothing and, and the idea that we were blamed one time um while before you know our film was completed we were showing excerpts around to some groups for for um, feedback sure and we took it we were invited to go to princeton to like present it to like the department of urban documentary filmmaking i don't remember the department but sure. it was a group of people we were in this really nice auditorium uh we show the excerpt during question and answer this older gentleman raises his hand and he asks me, do you know why the South Bronx burned? And I, you know, said, like, why? And then um, he said it was because of those Puerto Rican people were uh, cooking their pigs on a spit in their apartments. He was a professor at Princeton. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> Steve, for a minute, for a minute, because I, um, uh, if you get to know me, I always give people the benefit of the doubt. Yeah. I'm very that way. So I'm, I'm thinking in my head, okay, so where did I see that? Okay. Like I'm right. I'm trying to like go back in my memory at that moment. Like, okay, where did I see the, you know, the, the pigs on a spit? And then of course the facilitator says, Vivian, you don't have to answer that question. Let's move on. Yeah. You know, um, the, the gentleman came up to me. He was an elderly man. He, he began to explain that that's what he knew. Um, and he insisted that that was the case and my film crew and we were like, okay, you know, they got me out of there like to try to protect me. But 
um, you know, I was like, no, no, it's okay. But then I realized, okay, this is what we're going to have to deal with. Because people believe that I know. about us. Something as absurd as that. Right. Yeah. People believe that. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and the film, while we want to um, flip the script on this blame, people will always believe that the folks were to blame. Um, and, you know, that was very, that was an aha moment. It was very disappointing. Yeah. You know, I thought, okay. But we still, I think that what it did in the process of, coming to terms with the 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 sort of the the feelings that I had, the anger, the disappointment, it made me feel like, okay, we have to finish this film. Yeah. We have to tell the story. Yeah. It's gotta get we've gotta figure out how to get this money to finish this film and to then um, screen it to communities. Absolutely. So that folks and folks can see we another side of the story. Absolutely. You know, like first, so that that became kind of our determination. You know, we were compelled by I was compelled by it, and and throughout the other compelling part was this has to be for the people of the South Bronx. Like yeah. I'm making this film. Okay, we need a national audience. Okay, okay, we would love to show it. Blah blah blah. But it has to be for the people of the South Bronx. Yeah. Um, and and so that became one of our guiding principles um, throughout the film. And what's interesting. Um, <clears throat> is that we have screened the film in many parts across the country. Sure. Um, and no matter where I have gone to screen, um, mostly in cities, yeah. um, people resonate yeah. with the idea that their government abandoned them. Yeah. Whether it was in Miami or whether it was in um, Baltimore, we showed the film oh, in Baltimore sure. like four times. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, you know, whether it was in Boston, whether no matter in Rochester, in Buffalo, you know, uh, no matter where we've gone, California, Oakland, yeah. you know, um, people resonate that even though their neighborhood didn't burn, they saw a policy playing out that helped to destroy their neighborhood. Sure. You know, they see it. We even went to a place in, um, in Appalachian country, in um, oh, Kentucky, Whitesburg, okay. Kentucky. Okay, yeah. I remember before uh, going and before agreeing to go, um, I looked up Wikipedia and it said that it was 97% white. Yeah. And I'm thinking to Julia, who's you know sending me to all these places, why am I going there? <laughs> like, why are we showing it there? And blah, blah. And I don't know if I want to go. And so um, we go there and it's um, coal mining country. Mm -hmm. And the audience reacted like, yeah, we've been neglected. Yeah. We see you, we yeah. hear your story, because yeah. we also have that story. It Absolutely. was fascinating. Absolutely. It was fascinating. I know, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, you know, I think why um, things like the Poor People's Campaign under Martin Luther King resonated so much, and then, I mean, now there's another version of it with yeah. Reverend Barber, but right. yeah, yeah. Right. Wow, yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. Um, and you already mentioned, you know, one of the things that you're working on now, as far as um, as far as filmmaking goes, are you? Do you have other projects going on as well, aside from the austerity project? Um, um, no, not really. Um, one project. It's I. I don't know if you would could call it a project, but <clears throat> I'm trying to get uh, better street traffic signs on my block oh, in my sure. neighborhood. Sure. So you know, um, I'm listening into community board meetings, participate in. Uh, you know, we call it the Wakefield uh, Taxpayers Association. Yeah. You know, um, listening to some of the what's going on with the Workers Party um, uh, candidates, like listening into uh, <clears throat> what the candidates, what the elected officials have to say sure. <clears throat> about what they're going to do and not do. Listening to what's going on with bail reform. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> right now, um, and um, oh, and. I'm part of the Evelina 100 project. Sure, sure. <clears throat> Excuse Absolutely. me, which, and I'm on the academic committee. And so what, uh, one of the things that we're doing besides bringing on um, uh, educators and academics who worked with Evelina. Sure. At the time during, you know, at Hunter College, 
um, what we want to do is bring in people who um, who are doing the work in the spirit of Evelina today. Sure. So you know, uh, what were the issues then? What are the issues now? Yeah. Um, you know, kind of like um, what are the the uh, what are who are the activists? Who yeah. are the Evelinas now? Yeah. And what are they doing? And what are the causes that people are continuing to to work on? Um, particularly around housing and education in the Bronx. Sure. Um, so we're working on, you know, creating a nice um, forum um, for that to take place in September. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. That'll be yeah. a, a wonderful series of events, I know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I know that there are many other aspects of, of your life that we haven't covered. Um, would you like to talk about... Um, other aspects of your career or your family or, or you know, it, it's kind of open-ended right now mm -hmm. uh, as far as other things you'd like to talk about before like the final wrap-up question I have. I think, let's see. <clears throat> I think that um, I've spent my career working in nonprofit organizations um, in education for the most part. You know, when I was at Citizens Advice Bureau, yes, I supervised senior centers and things like that, but my focus was after school programming, teen programming, youth development programming, and <clears throat> with new settlement, um, you know, I was a director of community school partnerships for a school that was brand new, and we partnered with the Department of Education to support um, the school and create a community school culture. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I would have to say that in my experience all those years working sort of on the outside, trying to collaborate with the Department of Ed, that it has so much more, it has such a long way to go. I know. Um, our schools are not doing the work you yeah. know there are some schools you know i think that our the school at new settlement the community school at new settlement is doing a fantastic job sure um you know uh there's an elementary middle high school and they have um great performance um, outcomes and they're doing a lot of things with the kids so there it that definitely is a model yeah um and in my experience there was that parents were fighting at the bit to get their child in our school. Yeah. And while we saw that as a, we were flattered and feeling good about that success, the disappointment is that why is it that that is one of many? Sure, You sure. know, why aren't all the schools in the way that, um, so that parents can have choice of real quality schools. Absolutely. And so, um, you know, and even when, even back then when I worked at, um, at Bronx Works, um, supporting programs at like PS 130 and, you know, PS 90 and um, creating youth development models for not only, and, you know, I did work with GED kids and GED going to CUNY, kids who got into CUNY, looking at models for success um, for kids from, you know, um, poor backgrounds, poor academic, um, you know, histories, trying to make it in CUNY. Sure. Um, there, there's a lot of work. I don't know. I just feel um, that somehow this mayor or somebody has to crack open what really works yeah. and, um, you know, muster the political will to... <clears throat> to create <clears throat> the kinds of programs and expectations that, you know, um, that can allow our kids to succeed. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. And I say that because <clears throat> um, I saw the other side. I've seen schools where kids are, are do well, where yeah. the teachers create great expectations, where the resources um, allow kids to, to thrive. Yeah. And um, I'm not... I'm not certain, I'm not sure why that's so difficult to replicate. Yeah. 
the argument, and I've heard this a lot, that the kids are poor doesn't stand. For no. me, it doesn't stand. No. <clears throat> um, it doesn't stand. No. I think that there's a, a, an approach that needs to change. Absolutely. You know, like this, um, I don't know if we want to call it racist approach or, um, um, you know, the approach of like the, the attitude of lack that kid lacks, so therefore that kid can learn. You know, the CMS P327, the Mount Eden Children's Academy and the New Settlement Community Campus has shown that despite the poverty levels in which you know, 95% of those kids receive a free lunch, yeah. you know, kids can do academically well, can, you know, once you put the right mix in Absolutely. the classroom, in, lear in the learning experience yeah. and in the youth development experience, yeah. right? Um, so I'm not really sure where, when we're going to get to that political will. I don't think it's a, it's a, I don't know. I don't think it's a matter of um, like whether the kids can learn. No, I think the kids can learn. Absolutely. You know, I've seen that. And, Absolutely. Uh, so I, um, you know, I just wanted to put that out there. Yeah, I mean, and you know, it's always. One of the things that all of the, all, almost all the oral histories that have been recorded, I think, for both the Bronx African American History Project and the Bronx Latino History Project, like, really highlight is, you know, no matter what people say um, about uh, uh, about public education in New York right now, the resources devoted to it compared to the after school programming, the music programming, the art programming, which you already talked about that were there in the past, like, that's just not there right now. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think it's, it's no surprise um, that educational outcomes are poor when the resources and, you know, this huge variety of different kinds of activities that schools used to offer isn't there and isn't funded, right. you know? Um, I mean, in some schools, of course, the really good schools, like those, kind of, those kinds of things do take place. And I mean, you look at any of the schools, uh, you know, the really expensive schools like in Riverdale, they have all of that because they, you know, have all the money to, to do all of that. And why can't, why can't uh, right. people in the Bronx who go to public schools have the same thing? Right. That's the question. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I have firsthand experience with that. My kids went to Horace Mann. Yeah. 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 And every kid deserves that, that yeah. kind of education. Yeah. Every kid deserves it, which is why I'm like, that's why I say what I say, because you know, some of the kids from the private schools, while they were smart and everything, they have problems, just like the kids from our neighborhoods have. Absolutely. You know, they're not perfect kids, Absolutely. but they had the the um, the music program after school or during the day. You know, during the day they all learned how to swim. During yeah. the day they all received music theory 101. You know, yeah. during the day they all learned how to do basic drawing and take AP art classes. Yeah. Um, and it wasn't, you know. And they, yeah, they needed, they needed to just show up and get the work done. And, and the expectations were high that they, yeah, you can do the work. You can do this. Yeah. No, there was no excuse. Yeah. yeah you can do this. And that I think lacks in a lot of our schools. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, the final question I have for mm -hmm. you, I, I, um, I know we've been at this a while. So, uh, and I imagine your, your voice is probably getting the, getting uh, a little tired from all the speaking. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, here, here's, here's a question that we'll often end these on, is what does the Bronx represent to you? Mm. <clears throat> well, first of all, the Bronx represents home. Sure. Um, it represents um, possibility. Yeah. It represents um, connection. Um, it represents, you know, um, uh, vibrancy. It, you know, um, it's such a vibrant place. It represents culture. It represents um, my, you know, it's interesting because um, a lot of people I know have moved out, yeah. but it represents stability for me. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's my foundation. Yeah. And, um, uh, you know, it represents the best and the worst. Yeah. 
of this country. Yeah. Um, 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 it represents food. It represents, I don't know, um, you know, it's the, it represents the love that I have for my neighbors yeah. and the, na the love that my neighbors have for me right now. I know my neighbors love me. Yeah. Um, and I know that my neighbors know that we can depend, they can depend on us um, and that we can depend on them. Um, and that's critical. Yeah. You know, that's, that's important. That sense of connection that I learned growing up. Yeah. Um, and it represents, you know, reaching out like, um, but it represents that, uh, that the battle is still ongoing. Yeah. And that, you know, um, we still have many families struggling to maintain a home, to educate their kids, to live in safety. Yeah. Um, so it's sort of this duality of, um, of like what the world is, what the world offers. Absolutely. You know, it represents a certain level of beauty. Yeah. Um, but then there's this ugliness that's attached to it. And I think that that combination and the kind of like the polarity of it is what keeps me here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing mm -hmm. everything you shared today. It's really been a pleasure. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say before I end the recording? No, I just, I just feel like the, the one thing that I am curious about, um, is how we're going to come together to continue to work on um, the Bronx, you know, yeah. that we need to do a better job. Um, and when I say that we, I mean people of different cultural um, backgrounds. We need to all work together um, and, and not be in such isolation and not, you know, be angry. I think that we have to figure out how to come up with a collective um, purpose to work together to, you know, fight injustice and improve life for all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, you sharing your stories through both this and certainly even more so your film, I think is an incredible step in that mm -hmm. direction. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.